Mr. Clare here from Clare Maths. Today we're going to do the whole of higher maths in 2024 exams, hopefully in under four or five hours. Have a look at everything that's in this video up in the top corner here. It goes through topic by topic by topic, full in-depth teaching of the topics, everything you need to know. I've personally collected all of these past paper questions, made sure there's no repeats, made sure that it covers everything the ACE has possibly asked in the last, well, however many years the higher maths course has been going for. Pause the video anytime you want, try the questions and then see my solution and hopefully you'll have some success in your exams. Take care, stay safe and good luck. Hey, Higher Maths 2022, paper one, question one. Determine of the equation of the line perpendicular to 5x plus 2y equals 7, passing through minus 1, 6. Perpendicular, which means the gradients multiply together to give minus 1. So for gradient of this line, we've got 2y equals minus 5x plus 7. So y is minus 5 over 2x plus 7 over 2. The gradient of this line is minus 5 over 2. So the gradient of our perpendicular line is equal to 2 fifths since m1 times m2 equals minus 1. 2, two fifths of minus 5 over 2 gives us two marks already. Then we can just do the equation of a straight line. y minus b equals m x minus a minus minus 1 is plus 1. So y 5y minus 6, you might do, is 2x plus 1. Expanding our brackets, we get 5y minus 30 is 2x plus 2. So I'll leave it with 5y is equal to 2x. 2 plus 30 is 32. And you can leave it in any form you want. Y equals mx plus c. A multiples of y equals a multiple of x plus a multiple of a number. Whatever you want, really. So 5y minus 2x equals 32. And you can just leave it like that or in the, any, any other correct form for the equation. QA Higher Maths 2019, Paper 1, Question 7. The line L makes a 30 degree angle of with positive direction of x-axis, find the equation of the line perpendicular passing through 0 minus 4. Gradient equals tan of 30, which is equal to root 3. 1 over root 3. So that means the gradient of our perpendicular is equal to minus root 3, since m1 times m2 equals minus 1. And then we can just use y minus b, y plus 4 then, equals minus root 3x minus 0. So y equals minus root 3x minus 4. And we're done there. SQA Higher Maths 2015, paper 1, question 9. ABC are points such that AB is parallel to the line with equation y plus root 3x equals 0. And BC makes an angle of 150 degrees with the positive direction of the x-axis. Are they collinear? So you need to know what collinear means. They are all in a straight line. So if you work out if A to B are parallel and B to C are parallel, it means this B is a point in common, they would be in a straight line because of parallel or not. So let's just work on this. So the first part is to work at the gradient of A B. So for A to B, we have got y equals minus root 3x. So the gradient of that section is just minus root 3. For B to C, well, gradient equals tan theta because we've got the angle of 150 degrees. So our gradient is equal to the tan of 150. Now, 150 is uh, going to be an exact value. If you've got a cast diagram, we can see it's related to 180 minus 150. So if I work out the tan of 30, the tan of 30 degrees... is 1 over root 3, but 30 degrees is positive here and here, so that's 180 plus 30, which is 210, and that's 180 minus 30, which is 150. Here, tan is negative, so the tan of 150 is minus 1 over root 3.
and then we can just make a little statement since the gradient of AB doesn't equal the gradient of BC, the points are not parallel. And so they're not collinear. Not parallel. So not collinear. Now, if they were equal, you would then say they are parallel, but since B is a common point, they're collinear. Let's do a higher mass 2023 paper 2 question 1. Triangle, triangle PQR has these vertices. Find the equation of the altitude from P. Well, I've already drawn in that it's a right angle, so if I can find the gradient of QR, I'll know the gradient of the perpendicular. So part A, the gradient of QR. I've got 3 minus 8 on the top over 13 minus minus 2. y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. 3 take away 8 is negative 5. 13 minus minus 2 is 15. That gives me minus a third. And therefore, the gradient of the perpendicular must be 3 since m1 times m2 equals minus 1. And you always need that statement. So now we can use the point P to get the equation. So P is 5 minus 1. So I can use Y minus B, my minus minus 1 equals 3X minus 5. So Y plus 1 is 3X minus 15. And therefore Y must be 3X minus 16. And we're done there. Part B, calculate the angle beside PR makes for the positive direction of the x-axis. Well, we know that gradient equals tan theta. So we need the gradient of PR. So let's look at P and R. We've got R3, 3 minus minus 1 on the top over 13 minus 5 on the bottom. That gives me 4 over 8, which is 1 half. So our tan theta equals a half, so the inverse tan of a half equals, using a calculator, you get 26.565 or 26.6 degrees. And we're done there. Question five, the line, a line makes an angle of pi over three radians with the y-axis and passes through minus two zero as shown. Determine the equation of the line. Well, with the y-axis, that's not what gradient equals tan theta. It's the positive direction of the x-axis, so I'm going to have to get this one here. If you imagine I drew a, a little line here, these two angles would add up to 90. Well, pi over 3 is 60, so working in angles, if you want, you would get 30 degrees. So our gradient is equal to the tan of 30 which is 1 over root 3. And then we've already got a point, so y minus b equals mx minus 8. y minus 0 is 1 over root 3, x plus 2 minus minus 2. So y equals 1 over root 3x and plus 2 over root 3. And we're done there. Higher Maths 2022 Paper 2 Question 1. Find the equation of altitude for C, the median for B, and the point of intersection. So we've got minus 1, minus 1 down here. We've got 2, minus 4. And we've got 7, 3. Okay, so first of all, altitude through C. So starting at C, cutting this one at right angles we need the gradient of A to B. So that's minus 4, minus, minus 1, uh, over 2, minus, minus 1. Minus 4, add 1 is minus 3, over 3, which is minus 1. So the gradient of our perpendicular is equal to 1, because M1 times M2 equals minus 1. So we've got Y minus 3 is 1X minus 7 or y equals x minus 7 add 3 is minus 4. So we've got our equation for our altitude. Part b, find the equation of the median. So median through b means we need the midpoint of a to c. 
So let's call the midpoint M. We've got minus 1 plus 7 over 2. And you've got minus 1 add 3 over 2. Seven minus one is six, divided by two is three. Three minus one is two, divided by two is one. So we get three, one. So we need the gradient. So using our points, three, one, and the other point we're going to need to use for our median is point B, two minus four. So we've got minus four, take away one, over two, take away three. That's minus 5 over minus 1, which is 5. Y minus 1 equals 5. X minus 3. So Y equals 5X minus 15. Add 1 is minus 14. We've now got two equations. Chances are we're going to solve them simultaneously. Find the coordinates of the point of intersection of the altitude and the median. So we've got two equations. Y equals X minus 4. And we've got y equals 5x minus 14. So we can save it 5x minus 14 equals x minus 4. That gives us 4x on this side equals minus 4 plus 14 is 10. x is 10 over 4, which is 5 over 2. Or you can write 2.5. We know that y equals x minus 4. So that means y equals 2.5 minus 4, which is equal to minus 1.5, or if you prefer, minus 3 over 2. So the point of intersection is 2.5 and minus 1.5. SQA Higher Maths 2023, paper 1, question 2. P and Q are points minus 2, 6 and 10, 0. Find the equation of the perpendicular bisector. So if I've got a line, let's say it was here, minus 2, 6. And 10, 0. Perpendicular means at right angles, bisector means in half. So I'm looking for a line that looks like this, I suppose, where that's at right angles and it cuts it in half. So I'm going to need the midpoint and the gradient of perpendicular. So let's start off with gradient. The gradient of P to Q is Y2 minus Y1, so that's 0 minus 6, over X2 minus X1, 10 minus minus 2, that's negative 6 over 12, which is negative a half. So that means that the gradient of our perpendicular straight away equals 2. And we need to write since m1 times m2 equals minus 1. So we've got our gradient is 2. Now we need our points so the midpoint. So the mid of PQ. We add the x's. So we've got 10 minus 2 divided by 2. And the y's 6 plus 0 divided by 2 gives us 8 over 2 and 6 over 2 which is equal to 4 3 and 3. So we've now got our point and we've now got our gradient so we can use y minus b equals mx minus a. So y minus b equals mx minus a where that's our a and b and that's our m. So we've got y minus 3 is 2x minus 4. y minus 3 2x minus 8, so y is 2x, minus 8 add 3 is minus 5, and there we are. SQA Higher Maths 2017, paper 2, question 8, on sequences, this time it has quadratics in it as part of the question. So it says sequences may be generated by the recurrence relationships of the form un plus 1 is k un minus 20 and u0 equals 5, where k is a member of the real numbers. Show that u2 equals this uh, expression. Well, u2 is generated by u1. I've not got u1, I've got u0. So first of all, for part a, I need to find u1 because it will be k times u0 minus 20. And we know that u0 equals 5. So we can sub in that to get u1. 5 times k minus 20. And now we can find u2 because going up, u2 is just going to be ku1 minus 20. But we know that u1 is equal to 5k minus 20. So we can just sum that in. 
So that means that u2 is k times the whole of u1, 5k minus 20, then take away 20 on the end. That gives me 5k squared, multiplying out the bracket, minus 20k, and then we've got minus 20 on the end, as required. Part B, determine the range of alpha for which u2 is less than u0. So part B, if u2 is less than u0, then we can just say that 5k squared minus 20k minus 20 is less than u0, which was 5. And we're just solving a quadratic inequality. So now we're moving away from sequences and moving into quadratic inequalities. So let's just do this for the sake of completeness. We've got 5k squared minus 20k. And taking the 5 over, that gives me minus 25 is less than 0. And we can examine the turning points. So if we have to examine the turning points, that is happening when 5k squared minus 20k minus 25 equals 0. Taking 5 out as a common factor, we get k squared minus 4k minus 5 equals 0. And we can factorise as much as we want to get k and k. 5 and 1 and 5, it'll be minus 5 plus 1. So we get turning points when k is equal to minus 1 or k is equal to 5. So looking at the turning point, we can then just draw a quick sketch of a graph, noting minus 1, noting 5. There's your rough graph. And we want 5k squared minus 20k minus 25 to be less than zero so we're looking at if i just draw this in a different color it's less than zero when it's below the x-axis so it's below the x-axis in between these two points so that happens when minus one is less than k is less than five so when minus one is less than k and which is less than five and we're done there SQA Higher Math 2016, paper one, question three on sequences of recurrence relationships. A sequence is defined by un plus one is a third un plus 10, and u3 is six. Find u4. Well, part A. To find u4, we just sub in u3. So one third of u3 plus 10, and u3 equals six. So sub in six. So that gives me a third times six plus 10. A third of six is two. 2 plus 10 is 12. So we get 12, just like that. Part B, explain why this sequence approaches a limit as n goes to infinity. We can just say that the limit exists since, well, we're looking at the number in front of un, which is a third, and we just need to say that minus 1 is less than a third, which is less than 1, the condition for a limit to exist. And that's it for that mark. And then part C, calculate the limit. So part C, L equals B over 1 minus A. So we need to find our A's and B's. So A is the number in front of UN, which is a third, and B is the number on N, which is 10. So we can just say it beside A equals a third, B equals 10. So the limit is 10 over 1 minus a third, and this is non-calculator, so we need to do a bit of fraction work here. 1 minus a third is 2 thirds, so that's 10 over 2 thirds. To divide by a fraction is the same as times by itself, so going always times, and then flip the second one upside down. So that gives me 10 times 3 halves. 10 divided by 2 is 5, 5 times 3 is 15, so my limit to this sequence is 15. It's great, hi, Maths 2019, paper 2, question 4. It says, in a forest, the population of a species of mouse is falling by 2.7% a year. They increase the population site is planned to release 30 mice into the forest at the end of the year. It says, UN is the estimated population at the start of April, N years after the population is first estimated, and it knows that UN and UN plus one satisfy this recurrence relationship. State the values of A and B. So for part A, it's really about pulling out the information from the question. So let's have a look at this we have got is falling by 2.7%. So to work out A, A is going to be the percent times UN or but what's left over. So it's 
minus 2.7%. That gives me 97.3%. So A is equal to 0 0.973. And then B, uh, we plan to release 30 mice into the force at the end of each year, so B is 30. And we're done there. Question B. Explain why the estimated population of mice will stabilize in the long term. So it mentions stabilizing, so it means a limit exists. So we can say a limit exists since minus 1 is less than 0 0.973, which is less than 1. And that's all we need to say. Plus step 2, calculate the long term population of the nearest 100, and now let's find the limit. So for part 2, L equals B over 1 minus A. So we'll just plug our numbers in. B is 30, then it's 1 minus 0 0.973. 30, sorry, over 0 0.027, which is 111.11. 111.11. 111 or to the nearest 100, 1100. I want that done there. Basically, Highland Maths 2019, paper one, question four. A sequence is generated by un plus one is m, un plus c, where first three terms are six, nine, and eleven. Find the values of m and c. So we have got six, nine, and eleven. So we could call that the first term, the second term, and the third term. So the second term would equal m times the first term plus c. And the third term would equal m times the second term plus c. So we could just sub them in. So u2 is 9 is equal to 6m plus c, and u3 is 11, that equals 9m plus c. Simultaneous equations to solve. So we can just do 2 take away 1. That gives me an 11 take away 9 is 2 is equal to 3m. So m is 2 thirds. Sub that in, we get 9 is equal to 2 thirds times 6 plus c. 6, 2 is a 12 divided by 3 is 4, so 9 is equal to 4 plus C, and therefore C is equal to 5. It then says part B, calculate the fourth term of the sequence. So for part B, U4 is equal to M, which is 2 thirds, times U3, plus C, which is 5. And U3, remember, the third term was 11. So that equals 2 thirds of 11, plus 5. So 20, 11 times 2 is 22 over 3, so I might as well make the 5 15 over 3, so we've got a common denominator. 22 plus 15 is 20, 37 over 3. And if that's already simplified, I'll be done. Well, it is simplified, so I'm done. Basically, I'm asked 2015, paper 2, question 3, had this long one. Um, this is a version of the following first appeared in print in 16th century. Who does agree with your cares? A fog and a toad foot at the bottom of well is 50 foot deep. Each day the fog climbs 32 foot, rest of the night. During the night it slides two thirds of its height above the floor of the well. The toad climbs 13 foot before resting, then it slides a quarter of its height. So we need to see what this question is asking us, but it gives us two recurrence relationships. It says the progress can be modelled by this. f of n plus 1 is a third f of n plus 32, and the first term is 32. And then for the toad, Tn plus 1 is 3 quarters Tn plus 13, with the first term is 13. And it says F and T are the heights reached by the fog and toad at the end of the nth day, after falling in. Part A. Calculate T2, the height of the toad at the end of the second day, only worth one mark. So to calculate T2, you just sub in T1. So let's just go ahead and do that. So for part A, T2 is going to equal 3 quarters of t1 plus 13, but we know that t1 equals 13. So therefore, we can just say that t2 is equal to 3 quarters times 13 plus 13. Nice and simple there. Well, this is a calculator question, so we just do 13 times 3 is 39. Divide that by 4 and add 13, and we get 22.75. Okay, part B of the question says, determine whether or not either one will eventually escape the well. Now this seems to be like, well, what's this asking me? This, whenever a question says, 
basically will something happen after a certain amount of time and it's to do with conservation ships it's asking whether it's got a limit or not okay so if you understand that when a sequence has a limit you'll be fine now a sequence has a limit when a the number in front of here f of n or t of n in this case is between minus one and one so let's just say that so for part b if we look at our frog first of all that is f of n plus 1 is the third f of n plus 32. Let's just write that down. We can say that the limit exists because minus 1 is less than a third is less than 1. So the limit exists since minus 1 is less than a third, which is less than 1, and we can calculate that limit. So the limit, remember, is equal to b over 1 minus a, where that's my a and that's my b. So that equals 32 over 1 minus a third. And since it's a calculator question, you can just do that in a calculator, or without a calculator, that's 32 over 2 thirds. Now I'll just do it without a calculator just to show you how. So l would equal 32 times three halves. Divide by a fraction times by its reciprocal. 32 divided by two is 16. 16 times three is 48. So the limit, or in other words, where the frog will reach, will be 48. Now 48, we know the well from the question is 50 feet, and therefore the frog will never reach, will escape the well. So therefore the frog will never escape the well as 48 is less than 50. And then we can do the same thing for the toad. So let's look at our toad. His recurrence relationship was Tn plus 1 is 3 quarters, Tn plus 13. So the limit exists since minus one is less than three quarters, which is less than one, and we can calculate that limit. A equals B over one minus A, which is 13 over one minus three quarters, which again, you can just use your calculator to work this out, but that is 13 over a quarter. 13 over a quarter is the same as 13 times four over one. So that is 52. So we can then say the toad escapes the well since 52 is bigger than 50. And we're done there. S square higher maths 2019 paper 2 question 8 on functions and inverse functions. A function f is given by f of x is a cube root of x plus 8. It tells you the domain is 1 between 1 and 1000 and it's a real number. If inverse function is this, find the inverse function. So how I always do this is I let y equal the cube root of x plus 8 and I'll just rearrange that to make x the subject. So y minus 8 equals the cube root of x. Cubing both sides then, I get y minus 8 cubed equals x, and I then straight away can just jump in and say that the inverse function of x then is equal to x minus 8 cubed. I just swap the y for an x. Do not write at this point here, this is very important. Do not then write y equals an x there because you've already said that y equals this, so it doesn't equal that with an x in it. Just jump from here to here and you're done. Part B, state the domain of the inverse function. The domain of the inverse function is the same as the range of the original function, okay? So let's check the range of f of x. So I'll just write it down. Range of f of x equals domain of the inverse function. And becomes out and out becomes in. So what's the range? Well, the range of f of x is just putting in f of 1. Well, that's the cube root of 1 plus 8, which equals 9. And f of 
1,000, which is the highest number it can be, is the cube root of 1,000, plus 8. Well, 10 times 10 is 100, times 10 is 1,000, so that's 18. So therefore, the domain of the inverse function is, is, is 9 is less than or equal to x is less than or equal to 18. And we're done there. It's between 9 and 18. Five functions f and g are given by f of x is x squared minus 2, g of x is 3x plus 5. We'll define the expressions for f of g of x and g of f of x. And then determine the range of values for which f of g of x is less than g of f of x. Let's get straight into it. Part 1. f of g of x equals... So we've got f of x is x squared minus 2, so we've got g of x squared minus 2, and g of x is 3x plus 5. 3x plus 5 all squared, take away 2. 3 threes are 9x squared. 3 fives is 15 times 2 is 30x. 5 fives is 25 minus 2. 5 is 25 minus 2, so f of g of x equals 9x squared plus 30x plus 23. Part 2, g of f of x. Well, g, our remember, is 3x plus 5, so it's 3f of x plus 5. That's 3 times x squared minus 2 plus 5 so g of f of x is 3x squared minus 6 plus 5 g of f of x 3x squared minus 1 determine the range of values for which f of g of x is less than g of f of x so we're saying f of g is less than g of f. So in x squared plus 30x plus 23 has to be less than 3x squared take away 1. Taking the x squareds across, we've got 6x squared plus 30x plus 23 is less than minus 1. So 6x squared plus 30x plus 24 is less than 0. So we've got a quadratic inequality to solve. So let's look for a common factor. 6x squared plus 5x plus 4 is less than 0. So let's look at the roots of x squared plus 5x plus 4. So that factorises to give us x and x. We've got 4 and 1 plus and plus, so roots at x equal minus 1, x equal minus 4, so we can draw a quick graph to show the roots, minus 1, minus 4, less than 0 means below the x-axis, under here, well it's under here when it's between these two numbers, so our final answer, minus 4, is less than x, which is less than minus 1. SBA High Maths 2023, paper 1, question 13. Two functions f and g are defined as f of x is 2 sine x for between 0 and pi over 2, and g of x is 2x for between 0 and pi over 4. Evaluate f of g of pi over 6, and then find an expression for f of g of x. So, we might as well do the first one directly instead of going f of g of x first, but you could have done that first and then subbed it in. So, for part one, I want f of g of pi over 6. Well, g of pi over 6 is simply 2 times pi over 6, because g of x is 2x. That is pi over 3. So, f of g of pi over 6 is just simply f of pi over 3. f is 2 sine x, so it's 2 times the sine of pi over 3. So the sine of pi over 3 is an exact value, 
if you don't know it, pi over 3 is 60 degrees, so I've got 60 degrees here. I've got I think equilateral triangle, so it goes 2, but it's been cut in half 1, and that's root 3. So the sine of pi over 3 opposite over hypotenuse is root 3 over 2, so that's 2 times root 3 over 2, which is just simply root 3 as our final answer. Part 2, determine an expression for f of g of x. So f of g of x is equal to f of, well, g of x is 2x. So that is 2 sine 2x. 2 sine 2x. And we're done there. Part B, given that f of p is a third, determine the exact value of sine p. So f of p, part B1, f of p is just going to substitute p in, 2 sine p. That is told us in the question that f of p equals 1 third. And therefore, sine p is equal to a third divided by 2, which is a sixth. Part 2, hence determine the exact value of f of g of p. So p part 2, f of g of p. Well, f of g of x is 2 sine 2x, so f of g of p is 2 sine, just change it to a p. So 2 sine 2p, well sine 2p is 2 sine p cos p from the start of the exam paper. So it's 2 times 2 sine p cos p, which is 4 times sine p cos p. Now I already know sine p is a sixth. So if sine p is a sixth, if I draw a little right angle triangle and call that p, opposites 1, hypotenuse is 6. So I can do Pythagoras. 6 squared minus 1 squared, 36 minus 1 is 35, so that side is the square root of 35. So this gives us 4 times the sine of p, which is a sixth, times the cos of p, which is going to be adjacent of hypotenuse, which is root 35 over 6. You may be wondering, is root 35 a simplified third? Well, 4 doesn't go into 8, 9 doesn't go into 8, 16 doesn't go into 8, 25 doesn't go into 8. So no, it's, it's already simplified. So when we just times the top, 4 root 35 times the bottom, 36. Simplify with 4 and 36 to get root 5, 35, sorry. 4 nines are 36. Doesn't look simplified, but it actually is. There's nothing else you can do with that, so we're done. Let's go to your higher maths 2019 paper one question 12. Two functions are defined as f and g. You have to determine f of g of x. So let's do this. Question A, f of g of x. Well, that equals f of, well, g of x is 5 minus x. So I'm substituting 5 minus x every time I see an x in f of x. So that is 1 over the square root of 5 minus x. And we're done there. Part B, state the range of values which f of g of x is undefined. Well, it's undefined when either this is 0, because you can't divide by 0, or when 5 minus x is, is less than 0 because you can't square root a negative number to get a real value. So we can just write that undefined when, well, 5 minus x has to be less than or equal to 0, otherwise it's undefined. In other words, 5 minus x has to be bigger than 0. So we can then just solve that for x, take an x over to the other side, you get 5 is less than or equal to x, or to write that in a nicer way, x is greater than or equal to 5. And make sure you've got an undefined when, okay? This function is S for higher maths for 18, paper 1, question 2. G is defined on a set of real numbers by a fifth of x minus 4. Find the inverse function of G. So I can just write y equals a fifth of x minus 4. And make x a subject. So I've got y plus 4 equals 1 fifth of x. Times on both sides through by 5. I get 5 bracket y plus 4 equals x, and therefore our inverse function of g is equal to 5 bracket x plus 4, or if you prefer, you could expand the bracket to get 5x plus 20.
And we're done there. Yeah. Let's do a higher maths 2023 20, paper 2 question 6. A function f is defined as f of x equals 2 over x plus 3 for x greater than 0. Find the inverse function. So what I usually do with these is I write y equals 2 over x plus 3. There is other ways to do these. And make x the subject. So taking away 3, I get 2 over x. Multiplying each side by x, I get x bracket y minus 3 equals 2. And dividing through by y minus 3, I get x equals 2 over y minus 3. So then I immediately write down my answer. The inverse function of x is equal to 2 over, now just x minus 3. Make sure you do not write at any point swapping these back to y and x, because then you'll get an inconsistent answer and you'll lose a mark. Inverse functions, let's give you higher maths 2016, paper 1, question 6. F and G are defined in the real set of numbers and the inverse functions both exist. Part A. If f of x is 3x plus 5, then the inverse function of x. So for part a, I can just write y equals 3x plus 5 and make x the subject. So that means that y minus 5 equals 3x. And therefore, y minus 5 over 3 equals x. Don't now be tempted to write y equals x minus 5 over 3 or you lose a mark. Just go straight into, therefore, the inverse function of x equals y becomes x, so x minus 5 over 3. And we're done there. Part b of g of 2 equals 7, what is the inverse function of g of 7? Right, that sounds a bit strange, but this relies on you knowing what this means. If I put in 2 and I get 7, then that means that if I put in 7 in the inverse, that takes me back to 2. So that just means the inverse of 7 is just 2. There we go. Let's go to higher maths 2019, paper 1, question 10. Graphs of related functions. The diagram shows the graphs of f of x and kf of x plus a with the the values of a and k. So where's our f of x? It's this one here. And kf of x is the other one, plus a. So that's flipped upside down. And then it's maybe moved up or down. So to work out a, first of all, just compare it on this bit here. That's 0, 0. And that's 0, 3, it's clearly moved up by 3. Even if it's flipped upside down, it's still moved up by 3. So a is equal to 3. So we can just write down 3 straight away, no problem there. Now we need to find our k. Well, we know it's flipped upside down, so we know straight away it's negative. And how much? Well, just imagine if you flip this graph upside down, then you will be kind of drawing it like this. So this point here, 2 minus 1, will become 2, 1. So let me just take a note of that. That would kind of go up and become 2, 1 when it's upside down. But then we move up to 5. Now, even if I add 3, I don't get 5. So 2 times 1 is 2, plus 3 is 5. So that means k is minus 2. And we're done there. Hey, it's great. Hi, Maths. 2023 paper 2, question 4. The diagram shows a cubic with stationary points 2, 0 and 0, minus 2. On a diagram in your answer booklet, sketch a graph of 2 times f of minus x. So let's look at this f of minus x. What that means is it reflects in the y-axis because minus 1 becomes 1, 2 becomes minus 2, and so on. So if I take a note on this here, that minus 1 will end up over there at 1, and that 2 will end up over here at minus 2. And this one will stay where it is because it's on the y-axis. But with the times by 2 as well, so on the y-axis, on the x-axis, these are nothing for y equals 0, so they'll not move. But the minus 2 will go down to minus 4. So it's a reflection, so you'll end up with this sort of picture through 1. Let me do that more neater on a new diagram. So I've got it sketched out here. So we've got minus 2, we've got 1, and we've got minus 4 down here. And we're going to go up and down and back up. And we're done there. Solving logarithm equations, S square high maths for 18, paper 1, question 11. Diagram shows log 3x. On the diagram in the answer book, sketch the curve of equation 1 minus log 3x, and then find the point of intersection between the curves, which will be solved for the logarithmic equations. So 1 minus log 3x, the minus part here tells me to reflect in the x-axis, and then the 1 part 
which I'll do in another color here, tells me to then move up by one. So first of all, reflecting on the x-axis, this point will stay where it is, but this point will jump down here. And that would be at the moment as a, as a point three minus one. But now I have to move up by one. So this point's going to jump up by one. So that becomes one, one. And you can see this point goes up to three, zero. So I can just write the number three here. Getting rid of my intermediate working, which you could use a rubber if you were doing this by hand. And since it's reflected, it's going to go down and through here. So we can just draw that in, down here, through the way, and there we go. It's a reflection in the x-axis. Okay, part B, determine the exact value of the point of intersection, simultaneous equations. So for part B, we've got y equals log 3x, but we've also got y equals 1 minus log 3x. So we can say that they are equal to each other and find x. So log 3x equals 1 minus log 3x. So taking the log 3x to the other side, you'll have log 3x plus log 3x. So two of them, 2 log 3x equals 1. I can take the, power, the 2 up as a power, so I get log 3x squared equals 1. Now I've got it in the form log of something equals a number, so 3 to the power of 1 equals x squared. 3 to the power of 1 equals x squared, and therefore I can find x. x equals 3 to the power of a half, or x equals the square root of 3. And we're done there. Notice it'll only be the positive part of this instead of the negative part, because if x was negative, then you'd have log of a negative number, which doesn't exist, so it's just a positive. I can take a note of that, just positive value, as x has to be greater than zero. SQE 2022 Higher Maths Paper 1, Question 7. Triangles A, B, C, and A, D, E are both right angles. It tells us that angle B, A, C equals Q, and D, E, E, D, A, E equals R. As shown in the diagram, calculate sine R, sine Q. So we can pull some information out of this diagram by drawing some triangles. So let me draw the small one first. If I do a little sketch, we've got R here. This whole length here is 3, and the whole length on the top is 1. So by Pythagoras, 3 squared plus 1 squared equals 10. So that must be the square root of 10. We can do the same for the Q triangle. If I just do that at the side, if I call this Q, then on the hypotenuse, we've got root 13, and on the bottom, we've got 2. So by Pythagoras, root 13 squared minus 2 squared is 13 minus 4, which is 9. So the square root of 9 is 3. So nice and simple then. Determine the value of sine r. Sine r opposite of the hypotenuse is 1 over root 10. And sine q opposite of the hypotenuse is 3 over root 13. Two marks there. 1. Two. Nothing else you're going to do there, so let's go to part B. Okay, it has to determine the value of sine q minus r. Sine q minus r equals sine q cos r minus cos q sine r. From the start of the exam paper, you'll get that. So we need to work out our different things. So sine q is 3 over root 13. Well, cos r, well, we've already got r triangle here, so 3 over root 10. And minus cos q, which using this triangle is 2 over root 13. And we've got sine r, which we already know is 1 over root 10. Times in the tops of them, we get 9 over root 130, minus 2 over root 130, 
which is obviously 7 over square root of 130. Always double check if you can simplify that third at the end, but you can't, and you don't have to rationalise the denominator for the marks, because we're not examining that. So where do you get your marks for part B? If you go down sine Q cos R minus cos Q sine R, or you imply that by doing this, you get your mark. So there's mark 1 and 2. Substituting in, 3 over root 13, 3 over root 10, minus 2 over root 13, times 1 over root 10 is your second mark. And then your final mark, obviously, for working it out as 7 over root 130. So there's your final mark there. I am asked. 2018, paper 1, question 13, double angle formula and addition formula. The right angle triangle in the diagram is such that sine x is 2 over root 11. Find the exact value of sine 2x. Well, sine 2x is 2 sine x cos x. So I can write that 2 sine x cos x. So I need to know my cos x. So let's go back to the triangle. Pythagoras to get the missing side. So I've got root 11 squared, which is 11, minus 2 squared, which is 4. 11 minus 4, 10, 9, 8, 7. So the missing side is the square root of 7. So that means I've got cos x is equal to root 7 over root 11. So that's 2 times 2 over root 11 times root 7 over root 11. 2 times 2 is 4, so I get 4 root 7 on the top. Root 11 times root 11 is just 11. So 4 root 7 over 11. So for part 2, cos 2x is 2 cos squared x minus 1 using the start of the formula seat. So that's 2 times, well cos x remember was root 7 over root 11. I'm going to square that and then take away 1. That's 2 times root 7 squared is 7, root 11 squared is 11, minus 1. 2 sevens is 14 over 11. Take away 1. 14 over 11, take away 1. So take away 11 basically is 3 elevenths. So we get 3 over 11 as our answer for part 2. Part B, by expressing sine 3x as sine 2x plus x, find the exact value. So sine 2x plus x. This is the addition formula now. So start of the exam paper. Sine 2x cos x plus cos 2x sine x. Now we have already worked out sine 2x and cos 2x at the top, so just using our answers, sine 2x is 4 root 7 over 11. Cos x was root 7 over root 11. Plus cos 2x was 3 elevenths. And sine x, we already know, is 2 over root 11. So putting that together, we get 4 on the top, root 7 times root 7 is just 7, over 11 times root 11, plus 3 times 2 is 6, over 11, root 11. 4 sevens is 28, over 11, root 11, plus 6, over 11, root 11. That's a common denominator, so I can just add them straight away. 28 and 6 is 34, over 11, root 11. And we could just leave our answer there. I'm asked 2015, paper 1, question 10, addition and double angle formulae. Given that tan 2x is 3 quarters, part A, fine, cos 2x. Right, okay, so part A, we know tan 2x is equal to 3 quarters. So that means we can draw a right angle triangle, and we could call this angle 2x. And opposite is 3 and adjacent is 4. By Pythagoras, 3 squared plus 4 squared is 5 squared. This is a standard Pythagorean triple. So we can immediately write down cos 2x because that is adjacent over hypotenuse, which is 4 fifths. So a simple one mark question there. Part B, we have to work out cos x. Well, we can't go from cos 2x to cos x directly. Don't be tempted to divide by 2. We need to expand cos 2x. So there's the start of the exam paper. There's a number of trigonometric identities. Pick the one you want. 2 cos squared x minus 1 would work. So I'm going to pick 2 cos squared x minus 1. And cos squared x is the same as cos x squared, remember. 
So we know cos 2x is 4 fifths, so we've set up an equation basically, because that equals 4 fifths. So that means that I can add 1 to both sides to get 2 cos squared x. Well, if I add 1, it's the same as adding 5 fifths, so 5 and 4 is 9. That gives me 9 fifths. So cos squared x dividing through by 2 is 9 over 10. And therefore, cos x is the square root of 9 tenths. So I can write that down. Cos x is the square root of 9 tenths. Well, from the rules of thirds, I can split that up into two square roots, the square root of 9 over the square root of 10. So that's 3 over root 10. Square root of 9 is 3, and root 10 is already a simplified third. And we'll just define the exact value of cos x, so we've done that, so we're done there. For instance, a trig function, this could be higher maths, 2016, paper 2, question 11. Show that sine 2x tan x equals 1 minus cos 2x, and then differentiate sine 2x tan x. So part A, sine 2x tan x, well, we can change sine 2x to 2 sine x cos x, and we can change tan x into sine x over cos x. So that gives me 2 sine squared x, and the cos x obviously cancel. So then as an aside, remember we've got a cos 2x on the right hand side. Well cos 2x, using the expansion with sine squared x in it, is 1 minus 2 sine squared x. So we can rearrange that to get what sine squared x is. That means that 2 sine squared x, moving over to the right, equals 1 minus cos 2x. As required. That b, f of x is equal to 1 minus cos 2x now. So f dash x differentiating each function, 1 goes to 0, cos, remember, goes to minus sine, so it becomes plus sine, so it's sine 2x, because of minus minus, and then we need to, because of a chain rule, differentiate the inner function, which is 2, so times by 2, so we get 2 sine 2x. S3 Higher Maths 2017, Paper 2, Question 11, trigonometric identities, Part A. Show that sine 2x over 2 cos x minus sine x cos squared x equals sine cubed x. So the way to deal with these is just keep it separate, start dealing with the left and start making it equal to the right hand side. You may have to manipulate the right hand side separately as well so you get two different things equal, but in this case probably not. So let's look at the left hand side, we've got sine 2x, we can write that as 2 sine x cos x, just using the start of the exam paper, over 2 cos x, and then we've got minus sine x cos squared x. So we can cancel the 2s, and we can cancel the cos x's from here, so that leaves just sine x for this one, minus sine x times cos squared x. Sine x is a common factor in this case, so that gives me sine x bracket 1 minus cos squared x, and if you're paying attention, you'll realize that 1 minus cos squared x is also equal to sine squared x. Just check the, the exam paper. Sine squared plus cos squared equals 1. So that means I can say that that is sine x times sine squared x, which is equal to sine cubed x, as required. Okay, part B. Hence, differentiate sine 2x over 2 cos x minus sine x cos squared x between 0 and pi over 2. So if we're going to differentiate that, we can just differentiate the right-hand side because it's equal to it. So for part B, d by dx of the left-hand side equals d by dx of what we just found out, sine cubed x. Now, sine cubed x, remember, means the sine of x squared, so it's easier to write it like that to see exactly what you're doing. So if I just write sine of x, that's to be cubed. So I have to differentiate sine x all cubed. So that's the chain rule. So the chain rule says I take the power down to the front, I leave the function alone, so it's sine x, and then I take one away from the power, so that's squared 
but then I need to differentiate the inner function, which is sine x. Check with the start of the exam paper, sine x goes to cos x, so times by cos x. Tidying that up, that's 3 sine squared x cos x, and we're done there. Let's see how I'm asked 2023 paper 2, question 9. Express 7 cos x minus 3 sine x in the form k sine x plus a, so the wave function. So let's start off with expanding this. You've got k sine x plus a. So from the start of the exam paper, that's k sine x cos a plus k cos x sine a. And then we're just equating the left-hand side with the right-hand side from the start of the question. So looking at, if I highlight this, what's in front of sine x? I've got k and cos a. And what's in front of sine x in our question? Minus 3. So I can say that k cos a equals minus 3. Similarly, using a different colour highlighter for clarity, in front of cos x is sine a and k. And in front of cos x in our question is just the number 7. So I can say that k sine a equals 7. So now we can find k. To find k, because sine squared plus cos squared equals 1, if I square both of them, I will end up with k squared. So k is going to be the square root of 7 squared plus minus 3 squared. A bit like Pythagoras, essentially. So that becomes 49. And 3, 3 is a 9. So k becomes the square root of 58. I would usually use an exact value if we can. And then, because sine divided by cos is tan, I can say that the tan of a is equal to minus 7 over 3, or 7 over minus 3. So I can now work on a. The inverse tan of 7 over 3 is 66.8 degrees. So cast diagram, but it's not the cast on tan, remember, it's the cast on cos and sine, because that's what you started with. So looking at sine first, that's positive. So that is A and S. And then looking at cos, that's negative. Well, cos is negative on S and T. So therefore, the quadrant we want is this one, which is 180 minus. So that means that A is 180 minus 66.8, which is 113.2 degrees. So we've got our A, we've got our K. So to answer the question, it is root 58 sine of X plus 113.2 degrees for our mark. Now part B. Hence or otherwise, find the maximum value of 14 cos x minus 6 sin x and the value where it occurs between 0 and 360. Well, notice 14 is double 7, 6 is double 3, so that is just double this. So I just need to double it. So I can say for part B, if I write it out, 14 cos x minus 6 sin x, equals 2 times this, so 2 root 58 sine x plus 113.2 degrees. So for part 1, the max value, well, this is just a graphs question. It isn't a differentiation question. A normal sine graph goes up to 1 and minus 1, but it's been times by 2 root 58. So the max value is 2 root 58. Now we could simplify that by, well not simplify it, we could have that as a decimal because you're using a calculator if you want, but 2 root 58 is fine. There's no square numbers that go into 58. Part 2, find the value of x for which it occurs. So this x plus 32 is 113.2 is telling you something. The sine x, its max normally appears at 90. If I just draw you a little graph, here's a normal sine graph there. 
and it goes to one and minus one usually, but for this one, it's going to go to two root 58 and minus two root 58. If this hadn't been shifted, this number here, its max would be 90. But it's shifted to the left by 113.2 degrees. So all I need to do is do 90 minus 113.2. 90 minus 113.2 degrees gives me an answer which is negative. 90 minus 113.2 is minus 23.2 degrees. Well, that's no good because that's negative. I'm now in the left and I want it to be between 0 and 360. So to solve that is, remember, sign repeats every 360. So I'm just going to add 360 degrees and that will give me uh, in the correct range, 336.8 degrees, and we're done there. We've got express 4 sine x plus 5 cos x in the form k sine x r a, where k is greater than 0, and a is between 0 and 2 pi. Notice it's in radians, so I'll just work in radians for this question, and then we we'll have to solve the equation. Okay, let's do this. So part a, if I take k sine x r a, I can expand that straight away. Check the front exam paper if you're unsure. You'll get k sine x cos a plus k cos x sine a. So that means that 4 sine x plus 5 cos x equals k sine x cos a plus k cos x sine a. Well, 4 sine x, that's already got a sine x here, so that means that k cos a must equal 4. Similarly, we've got on this side cos x and this side cos x, so whatever's left, k sine a must equal 5. Sine divided by cos remembers tan, so if I divide at this moment in time, we'll get tan a straight away equals 5 over 4. We should check which quadrants a is going to be in. And we can do that by checking our original equations. This is positive, so we've got cos a. This is positive, so we've got sine and a. That means that the tan of this will only be positive on A because that's a, about to, the one that's ticked twice. So we're using the first quadrant, that's nice and easy, so we can work out A straight away. A is the inverse tan of 5 over 4. 0 0.896. So we've got our A. Now we need to work out our K. But sine squared plus cos squared equals 1. So that means that 4 squared plus 5 squared equals k squared. So 4 squared plus 5 squared equals k squared. 16 plus 25 is k squared. So 41 equals k squared. Which means k must be the square root of 41. I'll just leave it as a third. As long as it's simplified, that's fine. Or you could just square root 41 in your calculator and you'll get 6.4. But better off with an exact value. So then just to answer the question, remember the question was expressed in the form k sine x ad a. So as k sine x ad a, we've got k sine x plus 0 0.896. Question 3b, hence solve 4 sine x plus 5 cos x equals 5.5 for x between 0 and 2 pi. So we've already worked out what we've got root 41 sine of x plus 0 0.896. That's our left hand side and that equals 5.5. So we can divide through by root 41 so that the sine of our angle plus 0 0.896 is just 5.5 over the square root of 41. 
So we can work out if what quadrants we should be in with our cast diagram. So sine is positive, so we're in the first quadrant and the second quadrant, which reminder is going to be pi minus our angle. So we now need to work out our angle using the inverse sine in a calculator of 5.5 over root 41. If you do that in a calculator, you get 1.033. So in our first quadrant, that means that x plus 0.896, remember, equals 1.033. So taking away 0 0.896, we get x equals 0 0.137 as our first answer. Let's look at our second answer on our second quadrant. Remember that means that we've still got x plus 0 0.896, because that's our whole angle. But that equals pi minus, remember it was 1.033. So x must be pi minus 1.033 minus 0.896, which gives us a second answer of 1.213. So we've got our two answers for x between 0 and 2 pi. Remember, I was working in radians there. Let's go higher maths, 18, paper 2, question 8, the wave function. Part A express 2 cos x minus sine x in the form k cos x minus a. Okay, a quite standard question here. If we have to express it as k cos x minus a, I expand k cos x minus a and then equate both sides. So for part A, I can write 2 cos x minus sine x equals, start of exam paper, k cos x minus a is k cos x cos a. And then it becomes plus k sine x sine a. Because k is times everything. You could have like k bracket that, then expand the bracket. But it's quite easy to do it that way. So looking at what, in, what is in front of our cos x. On this side, in front of cos x, or attached to it is k cos a. And on this side, it's just 2. So I can immediately write k cos a equals 2. And similarly, looking at our other sine x, that's attached to k sine a, and this sine x is attached to a minus, so a minus 1. So I can immediately write k sine a equals minus 1. And now we need to just get our k's and get our a's. So to get our k's, because sine squared plus cos squared equals 1, you can just write straight away that k is the square root of 2 squared plus minus 1 squared, just like Pythagoras. That's the square root of 2 squared is 4, plus 1 squared is 1, that's root 5. So our k is root 5, and that's a simplified third. We'll now work on getting our a. Because sine divided by cos is tan, I'll show you that here, tan a is sine a over cos a. Tan a equals sine a is minus 1, or k sine a is minus 1, and k cos a is 2. But the k's cancel when you divide them, so you just get minus a half. So I need to do the inverse tan of a half. So the inverse tan of a half is 26.6 degrees. And then using our cast diagram to see which quadrant our angle is in. Now remember with this one, although it's tan A is negative, so you're tempted just to say T, S and C, it's to do with what sine and cos were. So sine was negative and cos was positive. So we tick for cos and sine. So when cos is positive, it's these two. And when sine is negative, it is these two. So it's in the fourth quadrant. So that means that our A degrees is equal to 360 minus 26.6. So A is equal to 333.4 degrees. And now we just write our answer as k cos x minus a. So our answer is root 5 cos x minus 333.4 3, 3, 3. degrees. And we're done there for part a. Part b, hence, so I always find the maximum and minimum value of 6 cos x minus 3 sine x 
and then find the value for which it occurs between 0 and 360. Well, if you look at this one here, that times 3 gives you this one here. So if I just times my answer by 3 to part b, I can find the max and minimum values. Well, just the minimum. Part b, since it is 3 lots of it, I can say we've got 6 cos x minus 3 sin x degrees is equal to simply 3 times the answer we just got, which is root 5 cos x minus 3, 3, 3 3.4 degrees, because it's a multiple. Okay, a minimum value of this, well, let's look at a cos graph in general. A normal cos graph goes between 1 and minus 1. This is the amplitude, so this one goes between 3 root 5 and minus 3 root 5. So straight away we can say that our minimum value is minus 3 root 5. So there's our first thing, and then we have to work out where it occurs. So, where does the minimum value normally occur? Well, usually it goes 90, 180, 270, 360. But this here, x minus 333.4, 3, 3 means it's been shifted to the right by 333.4. 3, 3, 3 now, if I shift from 180 to the right, it will take me outward for 360, so I need to find the next value. So you could just go up and then take away 360, or if you imagine the cost graph continuing behind me, that would be minus 180. So I can just do that shifted to the right. I would get 333.4 3, 3. minus 180. If I do that sum, I get 153.4. So it occurs at 153.4 degrees, and we're done there. Trigonometric equations, SQA Higher Maths 2019, Paper 1, Question 15. Solve the equation sine 2x plus 6 cos x equals 0. And then solve a new equation for part b. So for part a, sine 2x plus 6 cos x, a sine and a cos, they're different from each other. So I'll expand the sine 2x to give me 2 sine x cos x. And this time we're working in degrees, plus 6 cos x equals 0. So although we've got a sine and a cos, there is a common factor, so I can factorise. So the common factor is cos x, but it's also got a number attached. 2 is also a common factor, so 2 cos x goes outside. That gives me sine x in the bracket here. And 2 cos x times 3 is 6 cos x, so plus 3 equals 0. And then we've just got two equations to solve. We can say 2 cos x equals 0, or we can say sine x plus 3 degree, plus 3 equals 0. This one gives me sine x is equal to minus 3, which has no solutions, because the maximum and minimum of sine x is 1 and minus 1. So this one, 2 cos x equals 0, means that cos x also must be 0. You should know that cos x is equal to 0 at 90 degrees. If you don't, there's a little graph for you just to prove it. 1 and minus 1, it goes along 90, then 180, then 270. So we can immediately say that x equals 90 degrees. You could also say it's 270 straight away, but if you didn't know it was 270, cast diagram would give you the other one because cos is positive. So 360 minus 90 would give you your 270 as well. And we're done there for part A. Part B says, hence solve sine 4x plus 6 cos 2x equals 0. Part B, sine 4x plus 6 cos 2x equals 0. So part A was sine 2x plus 6 cos x. So the numbers in front haven't changed, so it's not a multiple. However, the angles have just doubled, so the frequency has just doubled. So that means that our answers to part A was when x equals 90 and 270. So now it's just 2x equals 90 and 270. There's no, no real extra work to do. So for part B, I can just say straight away, 2x degrees equals 90 degrees and 270 degrees. But I want to solve it between 0 and 360. So there's going to be more solutions in that because I'm going to divide my answers by 2. So I just add 360 to everything. I'll just write that here, plus 360. Then it's going to give me 450 degrees. 
and it's also going to give me 630 degrees. And then I can just divide each of them by 2 to get 45 degrees, to get 135 degrees, to get 225 degrees, and the final one is 315 degrees. And we're done there. Basically, I am asked 23 people to question 7. Solve 17x plus 2 equals 3 cos 2x. So it's a trig equation. I'm going to have to expand cos 2x and I'm going to have to use the sine one. So I'm going to rewrite that as sine x plus 2 equals 3 times. If you go back to the start of your exam paper, cos 2x is 1 minus 2 sine squared x. So then we can start tidying that up. Sine x plus 2 equals 3 minus 6 sine squared x. I'm going to take everything over to the right because it's going to be a quadratic sine squared sine and a number. So taking the 6 across, I get 6 sine squared x. I've got plus sine x. And we've got 2, then take away 3 is minus 1. And that equals 0. So we want to find how to factorise this, and it will be factorizable. so I'm going to show you a way. I'm just going to kind of write m squared, 6m squared plus m minus 1, so you can see this. It's, that's basically the same quadratic. Now, to factorise that, if I times the 6 and 1 together, I get 6. So I'm looking for numbers that times together to make 6, but add together to make the 1 in the middle. So that could be 6 and 1, or 3 and 2. Well, it's clearly 3 and 2. And how is it 3 and 2? Well, it's plus 3 minus 2 equals 1, and 3 times minus 2 is minus 1. So we can now split the middle term. So we've got 6m squared plus m minus 1 becomes 6m squared plus 3m minus 2m minus 1. And then we just factorise each side. So 6m squared plus 3m. 3m is a common factor you get 2m plus 1, and you've still got 2m plus 1 on this side because you need it to be the same, and we'll, it's just going to be minus 1 then, times 2m plus 1, so factorised that is going to become 2m plus 1 and 3m minus 1. So then taking this and making it our sign, that becomes double brackets, m is just your sine x. So we've got 2 sine x plus 1, and we've got 3 sine x minus 1. And you might have got to that factorization just by looking. Great if you can. So that means 2 sine x plus, and that equals 0, remember, 1 equals 0, or 3 sine x minus 1 equals 0. So the left-hand side, sine x is equal to 1 becomes minus 1 over 2, minus 1 over 2, and the other one, sine x, is equal to 1 third. So we need to do the inverse sine of just a half, and a calculator, if you don't know it, it's a calculator paper after all, the inverse sine of a half is 30 degrees, that's the exact value. But we need the cast diagram to pick the correct values because our sine was negative, so when the sign is negative, it's in these two quadrants, which is 180 plus and 360 minus. So our first two answers for the left-hand side, first two answers for the left-hand side are x equal 180 plus 30, which is 210, and 360 minus 30, which is 330 degrees. Now looking at our sign x equals a third, we do the inverse sign of one third on our calculator. And if we do that, we get an answer of 19.47. And again, a cast diagram for that side. This time the sign was positive, so it's just 180 minus it. So our other, other answers are 19.47. And we do 180 minus 19.47 in our calculator. And that gives us a final answer of 160.53. Or you'd be fine with 19.5 and 160.5. Square square high mass 2015, paper 2, question 9 for the addition and double angle formula. The ones of a turbine are turning at a steady rate. The height h of the tip of one of the blades above the ground at any time t seconds is given by the formula. 
Express 36 sine 1.5t minus 15 cos 1.5t in the form k sine 1.5t minus a. So we can write 36 sine 1.5t minus 15 cos of 1.5t equals, well, k sine 15t minus a. k sine 1.5t, sorry, minus a. So expanding the right-hand side, that's going to equal k sine 1.5t cos a minus k sine a cos 1.5t. If we look at what's in front of sine 1.5t here, we get 36. So 36 equals what's in front of sine 1.5t on this side, k cos a. And similarly, looking at what's in front of cos 1.5t on this side is minus 15. And in front of cos 1.5t on this side is minus k sine a. To rewrite that nice, more nicely then, I can say that k cos a equals 36, and k sine a equals 15. And now we're ready to get our k, because sine squared plus cos squared equals 1, that means our k squared will be 36 squared plus 15 squared. So in other words, k is equal to the square root of 36 squared plus 15 squared, a bit like Pythagoras. So that is the square root of 1521, use your calculator to verify that. And the square root of 1521 is 9, 39. So we know that k is equal to 39. And also we can work out our a because sine divided by cos is tan. So since tan a is sine a over cos a, I can write tan a is equal to 15 over 36. So I can find the inverse tan of 15 over 36. Inverse tan of 15 over 36, making sure my calculator is in radians, is 0 0.395. And now I just need to check which quadrant our angle is in. So drawing a cast diagram would help with this. Now remember, we're going back and looking at what cos and sine were. Well, we're both positive. So cos was positive, so that's A and C. And sine is positive, so that's a and c. So I'm in the first quadrant, so that means that a equals 0 0.395. And therefore, to answer our question, we get 39 sine 1.5t minus 0 0.395. And we're done there. So to follow on this question, it then says, and hence find the two values which tip a blade is at a height of 100 metres above the ground during the first turn. So we've just expressed this in this form, but then you've got plus 65 on the end. So we can just write that again, plus 65, and that's going to equal 100. So I'll go ahead and do that. So that means, I'll just call this part 2, our h equals 39 sine 1.5t minus 0 0.395 plus 65, and that's going to equal 100. So we've just got an equation to solve now. That means I can take 39 with 65 across, so we get 39 sine 1.5t minus 0 0.395 equals 35. So dividing through by 39, we get sine 1.5t minus 0 0.395 equals 35 over 39. So at this point, I can find the inverse sine of 35 over 39 using a calculator and get a value. The inverse sine of 35 over 39 is 1.114. And looking at our cast diagram, sine is positive, so it's in the first and second quadrant, so that's pi minus the answer. So we can also do pi minus 1.114 to get a second solution, and that is going to be 2.03. So that means we can say that this whole, the whole of this equals that, and the whole of this equals that, and solve for t. So 1.5t minus 0 0.395 equals 1.114, 
and 1.5t minus 0.395 equals 2.03. So solving the first equation, 1.5t adding 0 0.395, we get 1.509. And therefore t is 1.509 divided by 1 1.5, 1 1.006. There's our first solution. And our second solution, 1.5t equals 2.03 plus 0 0.395, which is 2.425. And therefore, t dividing through by 1.5, 1.617. Just put my units in here, so that's seconds and that's seconds. And we're done there. Of the rated functions, SQA High Maths 2015, paper one, question four. The diagram shows the graph of a function y equals p cos qx plus r. So it's a trigograph. I write down the values of p, q, and r. Okay, so we need to start off with what this function is. A normal cos graph, if you remember, goes between 1 and minus 1, like so, and it goes up to 2 pi. So the number in front is called the amplitude, then the period of how the frequency, and then how far it's moved up or down. So immediately we can see that if we look at the Q first, we've got 1 up to pi over 2, which means if I was to keep drawing that, I would have 4 up to 2 pi, because pi over 2 is 90 anyway. So I can immediately write down that Q equals 4, because I should have 4 of them up to 2 pi. Okay, to get our amplitude, if we just work out the difference between the maximum and minimum, I've got 4 and minus 2 is 6. So to get P, I can just do 4 to minus 2 is 6. Half of that is 3, so I get 3. P is 3. And then for R, well, now I've got P, it's easy. If, if it was just 3 cos X, it would go up to 3, but it starts at 4, so I've added 1. So R is just equal to 1. And we're done there. We'll write down the values of p, q, and r. Now, what's the function is 3 cos 4x plus 1. Twenty twenty two higher maths, paper 1, question 4. y equals the square root of x cubed minus 2x to the power of minus 1, where x is greater than 0. We have to differentiate this expression so let's get ahead and do that so our first step or our first mark is to rewrite the square root of x cubed is x to the three halves and we've still got minus 2x to the minus 1. If we've written that we get a mark there for this x to the power of three halves. We now need to differentiate our terms so our first mark is for differentiating our first term which is 3 over 2 x take away 1 from 3 halves and that's 1 half there's a mark there and then differentiating our second term minus times a minus is a plus so it's plus 2 x to the power of minus 2 take away 1 so our final mark is 1 here and 1 for this term here we do not have to go any further than that in this question so if you did go further, that's fine, but you don't have to. Basically, hi, I'm asked 2023, paper one, question one. Y equals x to the five thirds minus 10 over x to the four. So we need to get it ready to differentiate first to find the y by the x. So y equals x to the five thirds minus 10 x to the minus four. And then I can do the y by the x. Take a power out of the front. Take away one, so that is two thirds. And then take the power of the front in times, but minus times a minus is a plus, so plus 40x to the minus 5. You probably don't need to go any further, but just for the sake of completeness, that would give you 5 thirds, x to the 2 thirds, plus 40 over x to the 5, and we're done there. We have asked 2017, paper 1, question 8 on differentiating a polynomial. Calculate the rate of change of dt d of t is equal to 1 over 2t. So we need to get it ready to differentiate. Always need to do that. So d of t is equal to 1 over 2t to the minus 1. Do not be tempted to move this 2. That's just a half still. Separate it out. It's just the t that's moving. Once we do that, d dash t, take the minus 1 down. So we get minus a half 
t take away 1 from the power, we get minus 2. And if we work it out when t is 5, so d slash 5 is equal to minus a half times 5 to the minus 2, or minus 1 over 2 times 5 squared. Minus 1 over 2 times 5 squared is 50. So minus a 50th. Just a note, remember, rate of change means differentiate. Okay, differentiate the trig function. S square higher maths to 18, paper 1, question 3. H of x is 3 cos 2x, find h dash pi over 6. So if h of x is 3 cos 2x, then h, straight away you can just do h dash x is equal to minus sine 2x, well minus 3 sine 2x, but then we need to times by 2 because we need to differentiate with 2x part as well. So that's minus 6 sine 2x. This is a paper 1 question, so it's an exact value question. So h dash pi over 6 is equal to minus 6 times sine 2 pi over 6, subbing it in. That equals minus 6 times the sine of pi over 3. Or if you prefer to work in exact values and degrees, that would be 60. So that equals minus 6, the sine of 60, root 3 over 2. 6 divided by 2 is 3, so it's minus 3 root 3. And we're done there. One question 12 was, given f of x is 4 sine 3x minus pi over 3, evaluate f dash pi over 6, or f dash, differentiate your function at pi over 6. So, f dash x, we can check the front of the exam paper to realise that sine becomes cos when you differentiate it. So you should first of all start by writing 4 cos 3x minus pi over 3. And just for doing that part without actually finishing the differentiation, which I'm going to do in a moment, gets you your first mark. For your second mark, you have to then realise that this is the chain rule. So you've got an inner function of 3x minus pi over 3. So you need to differentiate that in times the whole thing by that. So in other words, if I differentiate this part, that's the constant, so that's nothing. Differentiate 3x is 3, so I need to times by 3. So we get a second mark for realising that and writing down it, we're going to times by 3. And then our final mark, of course, is evaluating it. So I need to tidy it up and then substitute pi over 6 in. So f dash x equals 12 cos 3x minus pi over 3. So f dash of pi over 6. And this is an exact value, remember, because we are non calculator. But I'll substitute it in first. 12 cos 3 pi over 6 minus pi over 3. We need to tidy that up. So that's 12 cos 3 pi over 6 minus 2 pi over 6, which is 12 cos 3 minus 2 is 1, so which is pi over 6. Pi over 6, if you prefer to think in degrees, is 180 divided by 6, which is 30 degrees. So it's the pi cos of 30. If you're not sure of what that is, let's draw an exact value triangle. If this was 60 degrees, that would be 30 degrees up here. This would be 2, this would be 1. 2 squared is 4, minus 1 squared is 1, so that gives you 3. So we get the root 3. And we're looking at the cos, so it's opposite adjacent over hypotenuse, root 3 over 2. So you get 12 times the cos times root 3 over 2. 12 divided by 2 is 6, so you get 6 with the root 3 as your final answer. And for all of that extra work, it's one extra mark. A bit stingy of the SQA there. So there's our, there's our final mark at this point here. Okay, the chain of the rest of higher maths, 2019, paper one, question six. Given that y equals one over one, oh, one minus three x to the half, and x is not a third, find the y by the x. Let's get it ready to differentiate. So y equals one minus three x to the minus five. So we'll do y by dx minus 5 in the front, 1 minus 3x 
take away 1 from the power, so that's minus 6, and then times by whatever's in the bracket differentiated, which is minus 3. So tidying that up, we get minus 5 times minus 3 is 15, 1 minus 3x to the minus 6, and we're done there. Next to the Harry Math 23, paper 2, question 5. A function is defined as f of x is 3 minus 2x to the 4. Calculate the rate of change of f when x equals 4. So again, a power word, rate of change, means differentiation, and then just sub an x equals 4. So f dash x, well, it's the chain rule, so I take 4 down to the front times by 3 minus 2x, take away 1 for the power, which is 3, but then I need to differentiate then a function, which is minus 2, so I'm times in the whole thing by minus 2. So f dash x is minus 8, 3 minus 2x cubed, because of the chain rule. Substituting in 4, f dash 4 is minus 8, 3 minus 2 times 4 cubed, that's minus 8, 3 minus 8 cubed, which is minus 8 times minus 5 cubed. Minus 5 cubed is minus 125. 8 times 125. 8 times 125 is 1,000. Minus times a minus is a plus. So there we are. Increase and decrease in functions, SQA, higher maths 2018, paper 2, question 3. A function is defined as a set of real numbers given by f of x is x cubed minus 7x minus 6. Determine whether f is increasing or decreasing when x equals to 2. So we need to work out the gradient of the tangent at x equals to 2. So f dash x is equal to 3x squared minus 7. At x equal to 2, f dash of 2 in other words, we get 3 times 2 squared minus 7. That's 3 times 4 is 12, take away 7 equals 5. And then we need to write a little statement. Since f dash of 2 is greater than 0, the function is increasing at x equal to 2. And we're done there. The range of values for which the function f of it, SQA, higher maths, 23, paper 2, question 10. Determine the range of values for which the function f of x is 2x cubed plus 9x squared minus 24x plus 6 is strictly decreasing. There's actually two ways to do this. Both involve stationary points. If you get the stationary points, you can then examine the graph to see where uh, the derivative is negative, or you can just examine the nature of the stationary points. So let's just look at the stationary points first. Stationary points occur when f dash x is 0. So f dash x gives me 6 twos is f dash x, 3 twos is 6, 6x six squared, 2 nines is 18, plus 9, 18x, and minus 24. And I'm going to look at that equal to 0 for our stationary points. 6 is a common factor, so I get x squared plus 3x minus 4 equals 0. So double bracket that up. X and X, 4 and 1 make 3, plus 4 minus 1 makes 3. So that implies our stationary points occur when X equals 1 or X equals minus 4. So then there's two ways to go now. I'll give you both options. I'll use the nature table. If you're using a nature table, you'll go along to minus 4, along, and then along to 1, and then along. And then you're just going to examine the derivative. So looking at our derivative, a number before minus 4, let's try minus 5. Minus 5 minus 1 is minus 6. And minus 5 plus 4 is minus 1. The minus times a minus is a plus. So it's positive there. It's 0 here. Between these two numbers, let's just try 0 then. Minus 1 times 4 is minus. It's negative there, so it's still negative there. It's 0 there. And then a positive number like 2, 2 minus 1 is 1, 2 plus 4 is 4, 6. Positive times a positive is a positive. So it's increasing before minus 4, and then it's a turning point, and then it's decreasing, still decreasing of course, and then it's increasing. So we could say strictly decreasing 
when minus 4 is less than x is less than 1 in between those two numbers. Or if you, and that works as well because the function is continuous. If it was discontinuous, it should be a little bit knackered. But we know it's continuous because it is. Now, if we move on to the other way, we could look at just the, the graph. So graph of the derivative, we know the derivative is a quadratic with states of what's at minus 1 and 4. So 1 and 4, so 1 and minus 4, sorry. So 1 and minus 4, and it's a normal there. So same idea. That's the graph of the derivative. That's the graph of f dash x. And that's negative below the x-axis, which is down here. So it's between minus 1 and 4. So again, you would stay the same answer. Minus 4 is less than x is less than 1. Either of those options will give you your marks, probably. Let's give you a higher maths 2023 paper 2, question 2. Find the equation of the tangent with... Find the... Let's give you a higher maths 2023 paper 2, question 2. Find the equation of the tangent to the curve of equation y equals 2x to the 5 minus 3x at the point x equal 1. Equation of the tangent. Therefore, we need the gradient using dy by dx and then y minus b equals mx minus a. So our gradient, first of all, our gradient equals dy by dx, remember. That is 5 times 2 is 10, x to the 4, taking away 1 for the power, and minus 3. So our x equal to 1, our gradient equals 10 times 1 to the power of 4, minus 3. 1 to the power of 4 is just 1, so that's just 10 minus 3, which is 7. Now we need a point. So when x equals 1, y equals, I substitute it in, 2 times 1 to the 5 minus 3 times 1. Remember, use a calculator anytime you want, but that's 2, take away 3, which is minus 1. So our point is 1 minus 1, and our gradient is 7. So we can use y minus b, y minus minus 1, equals 7, x minus a, which is 1. So y plus 1 is 7x minus 7. So y must be 7x minus 8. Oh, we're done there. Let's give you higher maths for 18 people in question 7 for the equation of a tangent. You've got this curve shown in the diagram. Write down the coordinates of P, the point where the curve crosses the y-axis. So for part A, cuts the y-axis when x equals 0, so subbing 0 in, that's really easy, 0 minus 0 plus 0 plus 5. When x is 0, y is 5, so it's 0, 5. Part B, determine the equation of a tangent to the curve at P. The equation of a tangent, I can find the gradient by differentiation. So dy by dx is equal to 3x squared minus 6x plus 2. And at the point P, P already we know is x equal to 0, y equals 5. So when x equals 0, the y by dx equals 3 times 0 squared minus 6 times 0 plus 2. 0, 0 plus 2 equals 2. So our gradient equals 2 and our point P, remember, is equal to 0, 5. So y equals mx plus c is the easiest one to use here. y equals 2x plus 5. Or you could use y minus b equals mx minus a and still get 2x plus 5. Question c, find the coordinates of q, the point where the tangent meets the curve again. So you're just going to solve simultaneous equations here. x cubed minus 3x squared plus 2x plus 5 was our curve. It's equal in 2x plus 5 at points of intersection. So we can solve that quite easily. If we, these cancel each other out, if we take it over minus 2x minus 5, they disappear. So that just leaves me with x cubed minus 3x squared equals 0. Common factor of x squared, so you get x minus 3. So that means that x squared equals 0, so x equals 0, or x minus 3 is 0, so x equals 3. Well, we already know 0 is one of our points, so the second point of intersection is that x equals 3. So when x equals 3, y equals 2x plus 5. So that is 2 times 3 is 6 plus 5, which is 11. The second point is 3, 11, and we're done there.
Excuse me, higher maths, 2023 20, paper one question eight, a function to find the set of real numbers by x cubed plus 3x squared minus 9x plus 5, find the coordinates of the stationary points of f and determine their nature. Stationary points means derivative equal to zero. So we can write stationary points occur when f dash x equals zero. So f dash x is equal to 3x squared. 2 times 3 is 6, so 6x, minus 9, and then the 5 disappears. So we're saying 3x squared plus 6x minus 9 equals 0. 3 is a common factor, so we get x squared plus 2x minus 3 equals 0. It's keeping our common factor a standard one to uh, factorise. We've got x and x. It has to be 3 and 1. And plus 3 minus 1 is 2, so that implies x minus 1 is 0, so x equals 1, or x plus 3 is 0, so x equals minus 3. So we've now got our x part of the coordinate, we might as well try and find our y part, so when x equals 1, y equals, substitute into the original, x cubed plus 3x squared minus 9x plus 5, 1 cubed plus 3 times 1 squared, minus 9 times 1 plus 5. So that gives me y equals 1 plus 3 minus 9 plus 5. y equals 1 plus 3 is 4. 4 plus 5 is 9. Minus 9 is 0. So our first coordinate is 1, 0. When x equals minus 3, we can do the same thing. So y would be minus 3 cubed plus 3 times minus 3 squared, minus 9 times minus 3, plus 5. So keeping your wits about, because it's an own calculator, 3 cubed is 27, so you get minus 27. 3 squared is 9 times 3 is plus 27. 9 times 3 is 27, but it's plus because of a minus times a minus, and then you've got plus 5. Minus 27 plus 27 is obviously 0, so then you've got 27 plus 5, 32. So your second stationary point is minus 3.32. So there's my two stationary points. Now we need to determine our nature by using a nature table. So a nature table is like this. We're going to go along to our first point. This is our x, so minus 3. And then along. And then we're going to examine the other stationary point. So I'm going to go along to 1. And then along. I always keep it separate in case there's a point of disc, a discontinuous point. I don't want to lose marks for it in this case, but just in case. So then we're just looking at our derivative, f dash x. So picking numbers, we know that at minus 3 it's 0, and at 1 it is 0. So we need a number less than minus 3. Now, it's always best just with a derivative to examine it already factorised. So just pick a number less than minus 3. Let's just pick minus 4. Minus 4 minus 1 is negative. Minus 4 plus 3 is negative. A negative times a negative is a positive. So I know it's positive before minus 3. So I can just write that. And after minus 3 but before 1, let's just put 0 in. That gives you negative and that gives you positive. Negative times a positive is a negative. So we know that it's negative here. And therefore, after minus 3 but before 1, it's still negative. After 1 though, just pick 2. 2 minus 1 is positive. 2 plus 3 is positive. Positive times a positive is a positive. So we get a positive again. So our shape, it goes up, along and down. So max, down, along and up. So it's a min. So we need to state that. So minus 3, 32 is a maximum turning point and one zero was it one zero is a min a mum turning point And we're done there. Yeah. Stationary points under nature, x squared, higher maths, 2019, paper one, question one. Find the x coordinates of the stationary points on the curve of equation 
y equals a half x to the 4 minus 2x cubed plus 6. Stage the point is a curve when the y by the x equals 0. So we can find the y by the x. 4 times a half, well that's 2x cubed, take away 1 from the power. 3 times 2 is 6, so minus 6x squared, and then 6 goes to nothing. In our little statement, stationary points occur when the y by the x equals 0. We've got 2x cubed minus 6x squared equals 0. Common factor of 2x squared to get x minus 3. And that means that x equals 0 because 2x squared equals 0 or x equals 3. And there we are. Simple as that. Graph of a derived function. S square higher maths 2019, paper 2, question 5. The diagram below shows the graph of a cubic with stationary points at minus 2 and 4 as shown on the diagram of your answer book. Sketch the graph of g dash x, the derivative. Okay, so let's just draw a picture here. Y and X. Now, we should first of all look at this. It's telling us it's a cubic. A cubic differentiates to a quadratic, so we're expecting a quadratic either going down the way or up the way, and we really just need to identify the roots. Well, the roots happen when the turning points because the derivative equals zero. So it's just, I need to know that stationary points occur when dy by the x is zero, which means that these are my roots. So I get a root at minus two, and a root up at four. So that means that if we examine before, before minus two, it's going up the way, it's then dropping down the way, and the derivative will be going back up the way. So it's above the x-axis before minus two, it's below in between the roots, and it's above again after four. So that's how I like to think of this. So I know I'm starting high, I'm dropping below between the numbers, and then I'm going high again, so my curve must come down like so. Obviously, I can't quite get the turning point. I know the turning point happens at 1 in the middle of the roots, but I don't know exactly what the, it would be on the y-axis, so I don't need to work that out. And there we are. There's my graph of the derivative. Um. S Gray High Maths 2018, Paper 2, Question 9 on differentiation and optimization. A sector with a particular fixed radius x and the perimeter p of the sector is given by this. Find the minimum value of p. So stationary points occur when you differentiate and make it equal to zero. So starting with p of as a function of x, that's 2x plus 1, 2, 8, x to the minus 1. So p dash x is simply 2 minus 128x to the minus 2, or it's equal to 2 minus 128 over x squared. So stationary points when p dash x equals 0, so that gives me 2 minus 128 over x squared equals 0. So we need to solve that equation, so getting rid of the denominator. So we have got, imagine that's over 1, common denominator is x squared. You get 2x squared on the top, minus 128, equals 0. So then we can just say that that's like over 1, 0 times x squared, 0, and this times 1. So we get 2x squared minus 128 equals 0. Simply solve that one. We'll just say 2x squared is 128, and x squared then is half of that, which is 64. So x is the square root of 64. So x would equal 8 or minus 8, but x is less greater than 0, so we can just disregard that one. So we've got x equal to 8. We now need to do our nature table to make sure that it's a max or a min. So looking at our nature table, we've got x, we've got along a8 and along, and then we're looking at p dash x. So a reminder of p dash x, it was... 2 minus 128 over x squared. Now obviously you can't pick 0 because you divide by 0, so any other number, 1 maybe, and 10. If I put 1 into this, I get p of 1, p dash of 1 even, is equal to 2 minus 128. Well that's clearly negative. 
that 0. And then if I put p-10, that's 2 minus 128 over 100. Well, that's 2 minus 1.28, which is positive. So our shape is down, along, and up. And therefore, x equal to a is a min turning point. We we'll define the minimum value of p. So remember, p of x was equal to 2x plus 128 over x. So at 8, that gives me 2 times 8 plus 128 over 8. That's 16 plus 1 and that gives me 4, 8, 5 is 40, 6 is 48, which is 32. What well done there. Okay, station reports under nature, SB High Maths 2017, paper 2, question 7. Find the x coordinate of the station report on the curve with equation y equals 6x minus 2 root x cubed. Then find the greatest and least values of y in interval 1 is less than or equal to x and less than or equal to 9. So part A, stationary points are current to y by the x is 0. So we need to get it ready to differentiate. So with part A, I've got y equals 6x minus 2. I've got x cubed. So the cubed comes along for a ride, but it's a square root, so it's over 2. The y by the x then. 6 minus 2 times 3 over 2, x to the half, because I take away 1 from the power, and then we can say that stationary points occur when the y by the x equals 0. So making this equal to 0, we get 6. These 2's cancel, so minus 3, x to the half equals 0. So 3x to the half equals 6, x to the half equals 2. Remember, x to the half means the square root of x equals 2. So I'm looking for, if I square both sides, I get x equals 4. And we're done there. Part B, hence determine the greatest and least values of y. So at x equal to 1, y equals 6 times 1 minus 2 times the square root of 1 cubed. 6 times 1 6, minus 2 equals 4. At x equal to 9, the other one, y equals 6 times 9, minus 2 times the square root of 9 cubed. 6 times 9 is 54, minus the square root of 9 is 3, so 2 times 3 cubed. 54, 3 3 is 9 times 3 is 27, 27 times 2 is 54, that gives me a big zero is the answer at the limits. So now I need to evaluate it at x equal to four. So at x equal to four, we've got y equals six times four, minus two times the square root of four cubed, 24 minus two times the square root of four is two, so two cubed, 24, two cubed is eight times two is 16, 24 minus 16 is 8. So then we can just state our greatest and least values. The greatest value is 8, and the least value is clearly 0. So greatest value equals 8, least value equals 0. And we're done there. The derived function, SQA Higher Maths 2019, paper 2, question 5. The diagram below shows the graph of a cubic with stationary points at minus 2 and 4, as shown on the diagram of your answer book. Sketch the graph of g dash x, the derivative. Okay, so let's just draw a picture here. Y and x. Now, we should first of all look at this as telling us it's a cubic. A cubic differentiates to a quadratic, so we're expecting a quadratic either going down the way or up the way, and we really just need to identify the roots. Well, the roots happen when the turning points, because the derivative equals zero. So it's just, I need to know that stationary points occur when the y by the x is zero, which means that these are my roots. So I get a root at minus two, 
and I go up at four. So that means that if we examine before, before minus two, it's going up the way. It's then dropping down the way and the derivative will be going back up the way. So it's above the x-axis before minus two. It's below in between the roots and it's above again after four. So that's how I like to think of this. So I know I'm starting high. I'm dropping below between the numbers and then I'm going high again. So my curve must come down like so. Obviously, I can't quite get the turning point. I know the turning point happens at one in the middle of the roots, but I don't know exactly what the, it would be on the y-axis, so I don't need to work that out. And there we are. There's my graph of the day. It consists of a rectangle, a pond, surrounded by a path. The length and breadth for x and y, and the path is 1.5 metres wide at the pond ends and 1 metre on the other sides, as shown. The total area of the pond and the path is 150. Show that the area of the pond is given by this equation. Well, we know the total area all the way around is x times y, or y times x. So we know, first of all, for part A to start with, that the area, total area, y times x, must equal 150, because it says so in the question, 150 square metres. If we go back up to the diagram, this distance here is going to be x minus 1.5 and 1.5, so 3. Similarly, going along the way, that distance there is going to be y minus, and you've got 1 and 1, so 2. So clearly the area of the pawn part is y minus 2 times x minus 3. So the area of our pond y minus 2 times x minus 3. We'll call that A. Now notice there's a y in here, but our question doesn't have any y's, but we know that y times x equals 150, so putting that back up there, y is 150 over x. Keep that in mind, because we can substitute that in for y later on. Let's multiply our brackets out here. A equals yx, or xy, minus 3y, minus 2x, plus 6. Substituting our y in, which is 150 over x, we get 150 over x times x, minus 3, 150 over x, minus 2x plus 6. So that simplifies to 150, minus 450 over x, minus 2x plus 6. So 150 plus 6 is 156, minus 2x, minus 450 over x. That's now a function of x. And that's exactly as required, so we've done part A. Part B, determine the maximum area of a pond. This is called an optimization question, so in this case we need to differentiate it and find the stationary points. So A dash X, we're going to have minus 2, and if I take a little note up here, minus 450 over X is minus 450X to the minus 1. So we've got minus 2, then plus 450x to the minus 2. Or, in other words, a dash x is minus 2 plus 450 over x squared. Clearly x cannot equal 0. So max or min stationary points we're looking for. So we want to set a dash x equal to 0. So that gives us minus 2 plus 450 over x squared equals 0. So multiplying through by x squared to eliminate the fraction, we get minus 2x squared plus 450 is 0. So 2x squared equals 450. x squared is 225. And therefore, x is the square root of 225, which gives us two answers, plus or minus 15. x squared equals 225, so x equals 15. 
we can discount the negative value based on the question and do a nature table for just x equal to 15. So we've got x up to 15 and then at before 15. So at 15, we have got it being 0. If we pick a value before 15 but not 0, as you know, then you will see that we'll have 450 over 1, take away 2, which is positive. And if you pick a number after 15, let's just pick a massive number, 100. If you did 450 over 100 squared, that'd be a very small number. Take away 2, it's going to be a negative answer. So it's negative. So the max area, a of x, was equal to 156 minus 2x minus 450 over x. So at 15, we get 156 minus 2 times 15 minus 450 over 15. That's 156 minus 30 minus 30 again, which is 96 so metres squared. Three high math truck 23 paper 2 question 14. The net of an open box is shown. The base is 3x by 2x with a height of h. Find the area of a net in terms of h and x. So for part one, we've got 3x times 2x. For this bit here. And then this will be 2x because it's just going to go up the side with that. So that's 2x. And obviously this is 2x as well. We've got 3x here. And then if you just imagine that over the top or around the front, this will also be 3x. So you've got 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So it's plus h times 10x. So that gives you 6x squared plus 10hx. And it's only worth one mark, so there we are. Part two, given the area of 7200 centimetres squared, so the volume is given by this. Well, volume of a cuboid is area of the base times the height. Well, the base is this bit here, which we already know is 6x squared. So that's 6x squared h. But that's got h in it, so we need to get rid of that h. But we already know that 6x squared plus 10hx equals 7200 from the question. So we can rearrange that to find h. So 10hx is 7200 over 6x squared. So h is... So 10hx is 7200 minus 6x squared. So h is 7200 minus 6x squared all over 10x. So now our volume is just going to be 6x squared times the whole of that. I've not simplified that yet because I'll just simplify at the end. So 7200 minus 6x squared over 10x. So that means our volume equals, well, dividing through by 10 first, I think. We'll get 6x squared 720 over x minus 3 fifths of x, so what I've done there, divided this by 10, so it's over, still over x, and then 3, dividing this by 2, you get 3 fifths, x squared over x, it's just x, so now I can expand the bracket, 6 times 720 is actually 4320, use a calculator, so you get 4320, x squared over x is just x, and then 6 times 3 is 30, 18 over 5, we we'll just leave it like that, yep, minus 18 over 5, and we get x cubed. Part B, determine the value of x, which maximises the volume of the box. So it's maximise, optimise, let's go. So for part B to maximise the box, we need to examine the stationary points, so stationary points occur when the derivative equals zero. So v dash, well, wait, it's a function of x, I suppose, is equal to 4320. And that's going to be minus 18 times 3 over 5 x squared. So v dash x is 4320. 
Uh, three times 18. Three tens are 30. Three eights is 24. So that's 54. So minus 54 over 5. X squared. And we're going to equal, make that equal to 0. So we can say that 54 over 5x squared equals 4320, just like that, taking the, that over to the other side. So dividing, times them by 5 and dividing by 54, well, I'll do that. So actually 54x squared equals 5 times 4320, which is 21600. So x squared is the square root of, divided by 54, is 400. So x is the square root of 400, which is equal to 20. Now, just a little note on this. It's actually equal to minus 20 as well, but you can't have a negative length, so it's only 20 if the one we're picking. So it's just 20 we're looking at. Now we just need to check, is that a max or is that a min? So x along to 20 and along. Examining the derivative to see if it's a max or a min. Okay, so we need to examine before and after 20. So let's try a number before 20. So let's try 19. 19 squared times 54 divided by 5. That number is smaller than this number. So that minus that is positive. So it's positive before 20. It's 0 at 20. Then if you try 21, the same idea, 21 squared times 54 divided by 5 is bigger than 4, 3, 20. So 4, 3, 20 minus that is negative. And therefore, we've just worked out that x equals 20 is a maximum. Turning point. So the box is maximized by x equals 20. Is it centimeters? Yeah. Centimeter. How about that there? Question here for this new, just an optimization question. Have a look, see if you can have a go at it and then come back when you're done. Minimize the cost of production, minimize, optimization that's your key power word for higher maths there let's try part a in any case so there is our box and all the information in it and i want the surface area so i'm just going to start working on it and see if i can get the answer close to what we have got so surface area we've got 3x times h and i can see i've got one of them two three four of them so first of all i can write down i've got four times three x h i'll put a dot for times and so it's clear and then i need to add on well i've now got my top and my bottom so my top is going to be 3x times 3x so that's 9x squared times that by 2 so plus 9x squared plus another 9x squared just to be clear but oh 18x squared straight away but then you've also got a hole in the top which is x squared by x squared, and I've got two of them, so take away 2x squared straight away. And then the bit that everybody can't always forget, I almost forgot it, there's a surface inside this tube as well, so I need to work out what that surface is. Well, there's going to be four of them, and it's just going to be x times h, so plus 4xh. Tidying all that up a little bit, my area is 12xh plus 4 4xh, that's just my first and my last one. And then my x squared is 9, 18 minus 2 is 16x squared. Or my area is 16xh plus 16x squared. If you can get that far, you're getting a mark. But we're not finished there because our area in the question's not got any h in it. So we need to work out if we can eliminate that h somehow. Well, let's look at the information. Ah. The volume is 2,000. Well, volume is length times breadth times height. So if I write that down and underneath, volume is length times breadth times height. Volume of the big box, which is 3x times 3x, which is 9x squared times h. So 9x squared h. But we need to remember to take away the whole, which is x by x by h. So that's just x squared h. 
So our volume, ax squared h, but that equals 2,000, it says. So I can now eliminate h from my area by rearranging this equation to get make h the subject. So that means that h equals 2,000 divided by ax squared. A mark for getting h. Now we just need to substitute it into a. So our a is 16x times h, 2,000 over ax squared. And we've got still plus 16x squared. Using a calculator, 16 times 2,000 divided by a is 4,000. So we get 4,000 on the top. And we've got cancellation to do x on the top, so x squared becomes x. So we get x on the bottom plus 16x squared, or writing it in exactly the same way we wanted, 16x squared plus 4,000 over x, which is just exactly the same as what I've just already got. And there's your third and final mark. Part B said, to minimise the cost of production, the surface area A of the box should be as small as possible. Find the minimum value of A. Minimum value optimization. Let's jump straight in. So part B, I want to optimize the area. To differentiate a function, we need to get it ready. So let's start with our area. We've got 16x squared, but I'm going to have to take that 4,000x to the minus 1. So I can differentiate it. And you'll actually get a mark straight away there for getting it ready. We now differentiate it. So a dash or a dash x. 2 16s is 32x minus 4,000x to the minus 2. And that's me differentiated it for a mark as well. So two marks out of six so far. Now, if we fix that by making it equal to zero because we're optimizing. So remember, stationary points occur when a dash x, I'll call it, equals zero. So we can say 32x minus 4,000, x to the minus 2 equals 0. For realising we had to do that and find stationary points, we get another mark. And then we need to solve it. We'll get another mark in a moment for solving it, but I'll show you all the working you need for solving it. So we've got 32x equals 4,000 over x squared, we could say, x to the minus 2. So multiplying through by x squared, we get 32x cubed equals 4,000. Dividing through by 32, 125. So x is the cube root of 1, 2, 5. There's only one answer to that. It is 5. So we now know that x is 5 is our turning point. But we need to prove and show that that is a minimum. We don't know if it's a minimum or a maximum, so we need to do a table of signs. So let's do our table of signs just to show that. X, going along, five, and we're going along. A dash X, so a number less than five, but not zero, because zero is undefined. Then if you picked one, say, you would get 32 minus 4,000 over one, that's a negative. So we've got negative, zero, hoping that after five is positive, but you can check. Just get yourself a calculator, pick a number close to five, let's pick six, say, 32 times six is 192. 4,000 divided by 36 is 11. That minus 11 is positive, so we can say it's positive. So our shape is down, along and up. Therefore, x equals five minimizes a so to get a remember a remember x equal to five we work out our area equals 16 times five squared plus four thousand over five one thousand two hundred for your final mark a note in table of signs here technically this is one of those ones where the function is discontinuous. In other words, at zero, because if you can't divide by zero, it, it breaks. You have to make sure that it 
you have kind of shown that it's in the neighbourhood of five. I always draw an arrow because the SQA take it to mean a number close to five, a number close to five on either side. If you do that and don't actually say any numbers, you will be fine. Hey, Scooby, hi, I'm Avs2022, paper one, question two. Evaluate two log three x minus log three four. So it's just it's a three mark question, this one. The first one we're going to apply is the idea that two log three six can be simplified to log three six squared. So you get your first mark for simplifying this first log to log base 3 of 6 squared and we can still write minus log base 3 of 4 as long as you wrote this there's your first mark there and then our second mark for combining the takeaways into one log as a divide in other words log base 3 of 6 squared over 4 there's our second mark there. Let's just take a note of that. And of course, our third mark for then evaluating what that is. So working it out. So let's do some work on that. Log base 3, 36 over 4 equals log base 3 of 9. Well, 3 squared is 9. So log base 3 of 9 equals 2. And there is our final mark right at the end for getting 2. Just a little note on this, if you did the correct answer but did no working on this question, you would get no marks. You have to show your steps to show that you understood it, otherwise the SQA just thinks you were guessing on this question. Okay, evaluating numerical expressions, SQA higher maths 2018, paper 1, question 6. Find the value of log 5, 250 minus a third of log 5, 8. So we're going to combine these, so we'll keep the log 5, 250 hanging out for a minute. But we can main, say minus log 5, 8 to the power of a third, because you can take coefficients up as a power. We'll work out that 8 to the power of a third then, so that's log 5, 250, minus, remember to the power of a third is the cube root, so it's log 5, 2. And now we can combine a minus, because a minus means you can do this number divided by this number, so as one log, we get log 5, 250 over 2. That's log 5, 1, 2, 5. So 5 squared is 25, so 5 cubed is 1, 2, 5. So the answer is 3, because 5 cubed is 1, 2, 5. And we're done there. SQA Higher Maths 23, paper 1, question 7. Part A, evaluate log 2, 5 plus log 2, 1 over 40. So part A, rules the logs again. The same base with a plus means I can times these two together. So that becomes log 2, 5 times 1 over 40. So that is log base 2 of 5 fortieths, which is log base 2 of an eighth, because you can divide by 5. So imagine that it's 2 to the power of something is an eighth, well 2 to the power of 3 is 8, so 2 to the power of minus 3 is an eighth, because it's 1 over, two, 1 over 2 to the power of 3. So that means that 2 to the power of minus 3 equals an eighth, so this means that the answer is minus 3. Part B. Given A is a member of the real numbers, and that log 8a is negative, state the possible values of a. So we're saying that log base a of a is negative. So less than 0. We don't need to write the as. So log base a of a is less than 0. Let's just think about it logically for a minute. Let's imagine that we did 8 to the power of 0, we would get 1. If we take a negative number then, we get 8 to the power of, let's say, negative 2. That's the same as 1 over 8 squared, which is a fraction. And if I take any negative number, 8 to the power of a massive negative number would be a fraction. So it's always going to be either as big as 1 or as small as almost 0. So that means that 0 is less than a is less than 1. 
we can see this on a graph, I suppose. If I draw a basic log graph, there is one there. And below the x-axis is when it's negative. So less than one is negative, but only up to zero. It never touches zero. So it's between zero and one. So that's another way you could have thought of it. S3 Higher Maths 2023, paper one, question three. Solve log 5x plus minus log 5, 3 equals 2. So rules of logs, if it's a minus with the same base, you can divide these together. So in one step, we get log base 5 of x over 3 equals 2. And then you need to get rid of the log. So remember, it's base to the power of this equals this. So in other words, 5 squared equals x over 3. Or to write it nicely, x over 3 equals 25. 5 squared. X divided by 3 equals 25, so that means that X must be 3 times 25, so X equals 75, and we're done there. SQA, Higher Maths 2022, Paper 1, Question 8. Solve log base 6X plus log base 6X plus 5 equals 2, where X is greater than 0. There's a couple of different methods you could have used here, so I'll go through the alternatives for you. Let's call this one method 1. And the first method is to combine the two logs. The plus is one single log. So we could write that as log base 6 of x times x plus 5 equals 2. And there's your first mark there. Okay, moving to the second mark, we can write that as 6 squared equals x times x plus 5. Or well, x times x plus 5 equals 6. So there's our second mark there. And then we can move on to try and solve that as a quadratic equation. So standard quadratic way, multiply out the brackets, we get x squared plus 5x. And that equals 36. So tidying that up, minus 36 equals 0. There's our third mark there for putting it in the proper quadratic form. And then our fourth mark, try to solve that. Double brackets, x and x, 9 and 4 times together to make 36, but take away make 5. So we've got plus 9, minus 4, so x equals 4, or x equals minus 9. But x has to be greater than 0. Because it says so in the question, so we disregard one of the answers. So since x is greater than 0, x equals 4 is the only valid answer. And there is our final mark right there. We have to have stated that x equals 4. We disregarded the minus 9 to get that final mark. Let's look at method 2. So method 2 starts the same way. We apply the same rule as before. So we write log base 6 of x bracket x plus 5 equals 2. And we get our first mark. We log base 6 of x x plus 5 equals the log base 6 of 6 squared. Because remember, log base 6 of 6 is 1, so that is 2. And that would give us our second mark. And then we can cancel the logs from both sides to just write x, x plus 5 equals 6 squared, or x squared plus 5x equals 36. And it continues in the same way as the last method. Minus 36 is 0. There's our other mark. And then for our final mark, solving that equation, we get x and x, 9 and 4, plus 9 minus 4 equals 0, so x equals 4, or x equals minus 9. But since x is greater than 0, x equals 4 is the answer. And there's our final mark there, for 4 marks. 10, 
the heptathlon was an athletics contest made of seven events. Athletes score points for each event. In the 200 metres event, points are calculated using this formula, where P is the number of points and T is the athlete's time in seconds. Calculate how many points are awarded for a time of 24.55 seconds in the 200 metres event. So we just need to substitute 24.55 in for T. So we've got P equals 4.99087. 42.5 minus 24.55 to the power of 181. That's 4.99087 times 17.95 to the power of 1.81. 9.9 .9 Let's just make that 929.04. It doesn't quite specify whether the points are whole numbers or not, so that seems reasonable given the accuracy of the rest of the question. Right, in the long, part B, in the long jump event, points are calculated using this formula, where P is the points, D is the distance in, K, in centimetres, and K is a constant. It says 850 points are awarded for a jump of 600. Calculate K. So we'll just substitute in and work from there. So we've got P, which is 850, equals 0.188807. D is 600, minus 210, to the power of K. So 850 equals 0 0.188807 390 to the k so dividing through we get 850 over 0 0.188807 equals 390 to the power of k logging both sides I'll just use the natural log. Taking the K to the front then. equals log of 850 over 0.188807 divided by the log of 390. So it's time to get a calculator to work these out. 1.40999, so k equals 1.41. So we have maths 2023 paper 2 question 13. A patient is given a dose of medicine. The concentration of medicine in the patient's blood is modelled by C of T equals 11 e to the minus 0.0053 T, where T is the time of minutes after the dose, C is the concentration in milligrams per litres. Calculate the concentration 30 minutes after the, the dose was given. Okay, so for part A, all we're doing is saying that C equals 11 e to the minus 0.0053 and that's going to be times on the top by 30. 11 times e to the power of, use my brackets, minus 0 0.0053 times 30, close my brackets, press equals, you get an answer of 9.3829, so 9.38 will be fine. Uh, milligrams per litres, whether or not we'll take a mark off or not for losing the units. You need to get units if you can, okay? Part B, calculate the time taken for this dose to become ineffective. And it says that the dose becomes ineffective when the concentration is forced to 0.66. So all we're doing is subbing in 0 0.66 to here and solving the resultant equation. So for part B, I'm going to write 0 0.66 equals 11 e to the minus 0 0.0053. T. So I can divide through by 11 straight away, 
If I do 0 0.66 divided by 11, I get 0 0.06 equals e to the minus 0.0053t. Take the natural log of both sides. You can either write it as log e or ln. I'm just going to write ln. 0 0.06 equals ln e to the minus 0.0053t. So ln 0 0.06 equals minus 0.0053t, taking that to the front, LNE. But LNE is 1, or log EE is 1. So that means that LN 0.06 equals minus 0.0053t. And then dividing through by the negative there, I get LN 0.06 divided by minus 0.0053. So just calculator, LN 0.06 divided by minus 0 0.00 by 3 and we get 530.83 times in minutes so 531 or any reasonable round in minutes make sure you write your minutes no need to change that to hours and minutes minutes should be fine Today, higher maths 2023, paper one, question nine. The diagram shows the graph of function f of x is log base 3x. x is greater than zero, of course. The inverse function does exist. On the in the diagram in your answer book, draw the graph of the inverse function minus one. Well, let's examine the inverse function first. The inverse function of a log is an exponential. And essentially, the easiest way to draw it, imagine a dotted line here, y equals x. The coordinates just switch places, okay? So here is my normal y equals x. So 1, 0 becomes 0, 1. And 3, 1 becomes 1, 3. And it just gives you an exponential curve. And that would be 1, 3. So that's the inverse function of x. So now I just need to take away 1, which means just to move it down by 1. So 1 is going to go to 0. And 1, 3 is going to go to 1, 2. So I can just draw it now. There's 0. It's obviously going to drop below because that's where your asymptote is, essentially. So it's going to go along, up through 0, and start climbing. And we just put that point on that we noted, which was 1, 3. So it now becomes still 1, but 2. And we're done there. Solving logarithm equations, S squared higher maths for 18, paper 1, question 11. Diagram shows log 3x. On the diagram in the answer book, sketch the curve of equation 1 minus log 3x, and then find the point of intersection between the curves, which will be solved with logarithmic equations. So 1 minus log 3x, the minus part here tells me to reflect in the x-axis, and then the 1 part which I'll do in another colour here, tells me to then move up by 1. So first of all, reflecting on the x-axis, this point will stay where it is, but this point will jump down here, and that would be at the moment as a, as a point 3 minus 1. But now I have to move up by 1, so this point's going to jump up by 1, so that becomes 1, 1, and you can see this point goes up to... 3, 0. So I can just write the number 3 here. Getting rid of my intermediate working, which you could use a rubber if you were doing this by hand. And since it's reflected, it's going to go down and through here. So we can just draw that in, down here, through the way, and there we go. It's a reflection in the x-axis. Okay, part B, determine the exact value of the point of intersection. Simultaneous equations. So for part B, we've got y equals log 3x, but we've also got y equals 1 minus log 3x. So we can say that they are equal to each other and find x. So log 3x equals 1 minus log 3x. So taking the log 3x to the other side, you'll have log 3x plus log 3x. So two of them, 2 log 3x equals 1. I can take the, power, the 2 up as a power, so I get log 3x squared equals 1. Now I've got it in the form log of something equals a number, so 3 to the power of 1 equals x squared. 3 to the power of 1 equals x squared, 
and therefore I could find x, x equals 3 to the power of a half, or x equals the square root of 3. And we're done there. Notice it'll only be the positive part of this instead of the negative part, because if x was negative, then you'd have log of a negative number, which doesn't exist, so it's just a positive. I can take a note of that, just positive value, as x has to be greater than 0. I'll erase it from a straight line for logarithmic graphs. x squared high mass 2019, paper 2, question 12. Two variables, x and y, are connected by the equation, and this is what you're looking for, y equals a, b to the x, a power, and we're looking at one of the axes is logged, but the other one is not. So it's only one log this time, but always start from your equation and get the logs coming out and see where you go. So I'll start with y equals a, b to the x, we have to find the values of a and b. So let's start with y equals a, b to the x. Just log both sides then. Our log base is 4, so looking on our graph, log base 4y equals log base 4 of a, b to the x which is a product, so I can separate that into a plus. So log base 4y equals log base 4 of b to the x. I'll write the x one first, like mx plus c, plus log base 4a. Taking the x to the front, we get log base 4y, that's a y and that's a log, equals x times log base 4b plus log base 4a. Well, it's y equals mx plus c is a straight line, so let's put the x on the end so you can really see it. Log base 4y equals log base 4b times x plus log base 4a. So that's like y equals mx plus c. So we can see our a gradient is equal to this number in front of x and our c is equal to this. So we can say our gradient is equal to log 4b. So let's just check our graph to see if we can work out the gradient. We're given two points. So our gradient is equal to y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So that's 8 minus minus 1 over 3 minus 0. That's 9 over 3, which is 3. So we know our gradient's 3. So log base 4b equals 3. Remember that means that 4 to the power of 3 equals b. 4 cubed is b. 4 cubed is 64, and therefore b equals 64. Now let's try our c. From the work we've just done, our c is equal to log base 4 of a. C is where it cuts the y-axis. We know it cuts the y-axis at 0 minus 1, so C is minus 1. So we can just straight away say that minus 1 is equal to log base 4 of A, or if you prefer log base 4A equals minus 1. Remember that means 4 to the power of minus 1 equals A. You can just write that straight away. 4 to the minus 1 equals A. 4 to the power of minus 1 is 1 over 4 to the power of 1. So therefore, a equals one quarter, and we're done there. Logs, finding the relationship from a straight line. So now we're changing the axis so that one or both become logarithmic axes, and then that makes a straight line so we can work from there. So let's have a look at this question. Two variables, x and y, are connected by the equation y equals k times x to the power of n. The graph of log 2y by log 2x is shown. Find the values of k and n. So I don't you can memorize how to do this, but I usually just start from the beginning, which is to say that y equals kx to the n. If I've got y equals kx to the n, I can log both sides. And the base is 2, so I can say that log base 2 of y equals log base 2 of kx to the n. Separating the product k and x to the n, I can say that log 2y equals, I'll write the x one first, log 2x to the n plus log 2k. So I can then write log 2y equals n comes down, log 2x plus log 2k. And that looks like now y equals mx plus c. That's like your big y equals, that's like your m 
x plus c. So our gradient is equal to our n, and our c is equal to our log 2k. So if we can find the gradient, we know our n, and we can find c, where it cuts the y-axis, we know log 2k. So let's look at our graph. So for our gradient, we've got along 12, and up 3, 3 over 12. So our gradient is 3 twelfths. So our gradient is equal to 3 over 12, which simplifies to 1 quarter, and therefore n equals a quarter. Now to get our c, we know that log 2k is where it cuts the y-axis. Our graph tells us it cuts the y-axis at the number 3. So we're just solving log 2k equals 3. That means 2 to the power of 3 equals k. 2 to the power of 3 equals k. And therefore, k equals 8, because 2 cubed is 8. And we're done there. Next grade high maths 2023 paper, paper 1, question 10. Show that x plus 5 is a factor of this, and it's a fourth power 1. And then, hence or otherwise, solve it equal to 0. So usually we do cubics, but fourth powers can come up. So you're going to show it's a factor, you're going to end up with a cubic, and you're going to have to then start with a cubic by just guess and check to find another factor. So let's start off showing it's a factor. Easiest way is using synthetic division. So x plus 5 is a factor, so I'm subbing in minus 5. So it's 1x to the 4 plus 3x to the cubed minus 7x squared plus 9x minus 30. So we drop the 1 down, times them together to get minus 5. Minus 5 plus 3 is minus 2. Times it by minus 5 again, you get 10. 10 minus 7 is 3. Times by minus 5 again to get minus 15. <coughs> <coughs> Minus 15 plus 9 is minus 6. Times it by minus 5 again to get 30. 30 minus 30 is 0. Two options for your statement. You could write f of minus 5 equals 0, and therefore x plus 5 is a factor. Or the alternative is just writing since the remainder is 0, x plus 5 is a factor. Either way, options are fine, but you need to write a statement. <coughs> Hence, otherwise, solve the equation. So part b, we now know that it becomes x plus 5. Then you've got x cubed minus 2x squared plus 3x minus 6 equals 0. We're going to have to check numbers here to find another factor. So the easiest way is direct substitution. So if I try try 1, we're going to get 1 cubed minus 2 times 1 squared plus 3 times 1 minus 6. 1 cubed is 1. Minus 2 is minus 1. Minus 1 plus 3 is 2 minus 6 is minus 4. So it's not that one. Try minus 1. You get minus 1 cubed, minus 2 times minus 1 squared, plus 3 times minus 1, minus 6. Minus 1 cubed is minus 1. Minus 2 is minus 3. Minus 3 is minus 6. Minus 6 is minus 12. So it's not that one. So then you would try 2, and you're just doing it systematically. Once you get bigger, you can go back to synthetic division. I'll stick with this for 2. Because it's quite simple, 2 cubed minus 2 times 2 squared plus 3 times 2 minus 6. That's 8. 2 twos are 4 times 2 is 8. Plus 6 minus 6, that's 0. Therefore, we've got another factor of x minus 2. So we're going to have to synthetic division it anyway, but we now know 2 goes in. So synthetic division just on the x cubed minus 3x squared plus 3x minus 6. 1x cubed minus 2x squared plus 3x minus 6. And we're subbing it in 2. Now you could have just done that to the start and done it for 1, minus 1, 2 and so on. We've got 1. 2 1s are 2. Minus 2 is 0. 0 again. 
plus 3, 3 twos are 6, get 0. So because since f of 2 equals 0, x minus 2 is a factor. Or since the remainder is 0. At this stage, you don't have to show that it's a factor, so you don't really have to need the statement, but just to be on the safe side. So we've got x plus 3 still, x plus 5 still, sorry, and then x minus 2. So that implies our original function, which is x4 plus 3x cubed. Minus 7x squared plus 9x. minus 30 equals 0, becomes x plus 5, x minus 2, and then we've got, this has become a quadratic x squared, plus 0x plus 3, and that equals 0. Now we need to solve it, so each factor becomes equal to 0, so that implies that x plus 5 equals 0, or x minus 2 equals 0, or we could say x plus 3 equals 0. The first one gives us x equals minus 5, second x equals 2, and this one, no solutions because... If you take it over to the other side, you get x squared equals minus 3, and you can't square a negative number. This is in the main of the SQA High Master 18, paper 2, question 7. Part A, show that x minus 2 is a factor, then factorise fully. Then part B is a sequence question. Sequence is not in the course this year, but I'll show part B anyway for the sake of completeness. Show that x minus 2 is a factor of 2x cubed minus 3x squared minus 3x plus 2. So we can set up our synthetic division. We've got 2 minus 3. We've got minus 3 and 2, and it was x minus 2 is a factor, so we can sub 2 in. So dropping a 2 down, 2 2s is 4, 4 minus 3 is 1, 2 1s is 2, 2 minus 3 is minus 1, 2 times minus 1 is minus 2, and we get 0. And therefore, since the remainder is 0, x minus 2 is a factor. And now we can try and factorise it. So we've got x minus 2. This is for part 2. And we've got 2x squared plus x minus 1 from the work we just did up here. That's x minus 2, double brackets, 2x and x. It can only be 1 and 1. So I just need to get my signs right. So it's plus 2 minus 1, so plus 1 and minus 1 here. And that's it factorised for our second mark. Okay, part B of this question is a sequence question, so you can skip ahead if you're just wanting to f f revise polynomials at the moment. But for the sake of completeness, I'll finish the whole question. So it says, the fifth term of a sequence is given by u5 equals 2a minus 3, and it satisfies this recurrence relationship. Show that u7 is that. So we just need to go up to u6, then u7. So for part B, u6 from this bit here, is a times u5 minus 1, the one before, a u5 minus 1. So that equals a times 2a minus 3, take away 1. So u6 is equal to 2a squared minus 3a minus 1. And now we need to do u7. Well, u7 is going to be a times u6 minus 1. So that is a times 2a squared minus 3a minus 1. Take away 1. Multiplying the brackets out, we get 2a cubed minus 3a squared minus a minus 1. And there's our u7. Okay, going on to part C of this question. For this sequence, it is known that u7 equals u5 and a limit exists. Determine the value of a. So let's do part a first. Part 1 first, u5 equals u7. So I can just write u5 again, which was 2a minus 3. So we know that 2a minus 3 on the right equals 2a cubed minus 3a squared minus a minus 1. And we need to solve this equation. So moving everything to the right, we get 2a cubed minus 3a squared minus a minus 2a is minus 3a. 
minus 1 plus 3, 3 minus 1 is 2, so plus 2 equals 0. So we've now got a cubic to solve, so it's actually back to polynomials. 2a cubed minus 3a squared minus 3a plus 2, we've already factorised that. So taking our answer from part a, a minus 2, 2a minus 1, and a plus 1 equals 0. So that means that a equals 2. 2a equals 1, so a equals a half, and a equals minus 1. I will solve that. The limit exists, calculate the limit. So this is just a pure sequence question for a limit to, if the limit exists, that implies that minus 1 is less than a is less than 1, and therefore a must equal a half because the other two ones are invalid. The limit is given by b over 1 minus a. So remember, un plus 1 was equal to a un minus 1. We now know that, so b is our last number, so it's minus 1 over 1 minus a half. That's minus 1 over a half, which is minus 2. So the limit of the sequence is minus 2. SQA, hi, I'm asked 2016, paper 1, question 15, identify a polynomial from its roots. So the diagram below shows the graph of f of x, which is kx minus ax minus b squared. Find the values of a, b, and k. There's one of my roots there. And there's the other root there. That's a repeated root. And I know that because it's a turning point and a root. So that one is my b. And the other one is my a. So I can immediately say for part a, f of x equals k times x minus 4, x plus 5 squared. And then we can use the point 1, 9 to work out our k. x equals 1, y equals 9. So we get 9 equals 1, k times 1 minus 4, 1 plus 5 all squared. So 9 equals k times minus 3. 1 plus 5 is 6. 6, 6 is 36. So 9 equals minus 108k. So k is 9 over minus 108. It's minus 12. So we've got k is minus a 12. We've got a equals 4. And b was equal to minus 5, remember from our, our roots, 4 and minus 5. So we're done there. Part B says, for the function g of x equals f of x minus d, where d is positive, determine the range of values for d so that g of x has exactly one real root. Okay, let's have a look at this. If it's got one real root, it only crosses the x-axis at one point. So this is going to move down, so that makes it go, but it's still going up, so this turning point has to go underneath here. So that the only places, place it crosses is when it first initially drops down. Then it goes up and it's going to turn before it hits there and go back down. Well, that length is 9, so D must be greater than 9, and it's as simple as that. So it's just really working that out by looking. So for part B, I just write D is greater than 9, and we're done there. Unusual question, SQ High Maths for 18 people, 1 question 15. A cubic function is defined a set of real numbers. X plus 4 is a factor, X equals 2 is a root, F dash minus 2 equals 0, and F dash X is greater than 0 when the graph crosses the Y axis. X plus 4 is a factor, means that X equals minus 4 is a root, that's where it crosses the X axis. X equals 2 is a repeated root, which means that it's also a turning point on the X axis. That's what happens when you've got a repeated root. So we can start drawing a graph, we can look at the other options in a minute. But if we draw a y and x axis, just a quick sketch, we've got minus 4 as one of our roots, and we've got 2 as, I'll just put it here actually, as another root. And when looking at our derivatives, f dash of minus 2 equals 0. So we now know that at minus 2 at some point, we've got a turning point as well, not on the x axis, but then we also know that f dash x is greater than 0 when it crosses the y-axis. So we know that it's going up at this point, but this is a turning point, so it must drop back down. So we now know that it must go like this. And we know that this is a turning point, so it must 
turn here and go up here because that's a route. So we've got a route, a repeated route, and we're done there. Let's give a higher maths for 18 paper one question. Seven for the equation of a tangent. You've got this curve shown in the diagram. Write down the coordinates of P, the point where the curve crosses the y-axis. So for part A, cuts the y-axis when x equals 0. So subbing 0 in, that's really easy. 0 minus 0 plus 0 plus 5. When x is 0, y is 5, so it's 0, 5. Part B, determine the equation of a tangent to the curve at P. The equation of a tangent, I can find the gradient by differentiation. So dy by dx is equal to 3x squared minus 6x plus 2. And at the point P, P already we know is x equal to 0, y equals 5. So when x equals 0, dy by dx equals 3 times 0 squared minus 6 times 0 plus 2. 0, 0 plus 2 equals 2. So our gradient equals 2 and our point P, remember, is equal to 0, 5. So y equals mx plus c is the easiest one to use here. y equals 2x plus 5. Or you could use y minus b equals mx minus a and still get 2x plus 5. Question c, find the coordinates of q, the point where the tangent meets the curve again. So you're just going to solve simultaneous equations here. x cubed minus 3x squared plus 2x plus 5 was our curve. It's equal in 2x plus 5 at points of intersection. So we can solve that quite easily. If we, these cancel each other out, if we take it over minus 2x minus 5, they disappear. So that just leaves me with x cubed minus 3x squared equals 0. Common factor of x squared, so you get x minus 3. So that means that x squared equals 0, so x equals 0, or x minus 3 is 0, so x equals 3. Well, we already know 0 is one of our points, so the second point of intersection is that x equals 3. So when x equals 3, y equals 2x plus 5. So that is 2 times 3 is 6 plus 5, which is 11. The second point is 3, 11, and we're done there. X degree higher maths 2018, paper two, question four. Express minus 3x squared minus 6x plus 7 and ax plus b squared plus c. So complete the square on this. So we take our function and we take the common factor out, which is minus 3 of the first two terms. So that gives us minus 3. We've got x squared then plus 2x, because minus 3 times 2 is 6x. And then we've still got the plus 7 on the end. So completing the square on this bit, we get minus 3, half the term, so x plus 1 all squared, and take away 1 squared, 1 times 1. And then we've still got plus 7, so that gives me minus 3, x plus 1 squared, minus 1, plus 7, and then expanding that bracket, that's minus 3, x plus 1 squared. 3 times 1 is 3, it's minus times a minus, so it's plus 3 plus 7. And then finally, our final answer, minus 3, x plus 1 squared plus 10. And we're done there. Increasing and decreasing functions, let's do a higher maths. 2019, paper 2, question 7. Express this in the form p, x plus q squared plus r. Now let's complete the square. So for part a, if we look at these two, we can take minus 6 out as a common factor, so we get minus 6, and we get x squared minus 4x. 6 times 4 is plus 24. Take away 25, sitting on the end, and then we just completely square the normal way on this term. So we've got, that gives you minus 6, half the middle term, x minus 2, all squared, and then immediately take away 2 squared, and we've still got minus 25 on the end. Just be aware that this is all times by minus 6, though, so we need big brackets around it. So that gives us minus 6, x minus 2 squared. 2 twos is 4, 4 sixes is 24. So we get plus 24, minus 25 sitting on the end. So that's minus 6, x minus 2 squared. 24 minus 25 is minus 1.
Part B says, given that f of x is minus 2x cubed plus 12x squared minus 25x plus 9, show that it's strictly decreasing. So to show that something's increased or decreased, we need to evaluate the gradient of the tangent and always differentiate. So let's look at f dash x. f dash x equals 3 times 2 is 6, so minus 6x squared. 12 times 2 is 24, so plus 24x and minus 25. So we've differentiated it. But notice that is minus 6x squared plus 24x minus 25 is exactly what we were asked to do with something with completing the square on part A. So it's to do with the fact that it's completed the square. So we can now just say that f dash x now equals minus 6x minus 2 squared minus 1. If I pick any number for x here and I square it, I get a positive number. So that means I can then say x minus 2 squared is positive for all values of x. And that means that when I've got a positive, a positive times a negative is a negative. Take away another one gives me a negative as well. So all I need to then say is Therefore, minus 6x minus 2 squared minus 1 is negative for all values of x. So f of x is strictly decreasing. And we're done there. Okay, completing the square, s squared higher maths 2015, paper 2, question 2. The functions f and g are defined on suitable domains by these. First of all, it's a composite function question, but then was a bit of completing the square at the end. So part a, f of g of x. Well, f of x is 10 plus x, so that's 10 plus g of x. So that's 10 plus... 1 plus x, 3 minus x, plus 2. Let me tidy that up a little bit. So I'll expand the brackets. That's 10 plus 1 times 3 is 3. Minus x plus 3x is plus 2x. Minus x squared plus 2. So that equals 10 plus 3 is 13 plus 2 is 15. So it's 15 plus 2x minus x squared. Or you can write that, minus x squared plus 2x plus 15. But I'll just leave it there. Part B, I've got f of g of x equals minus x squared plus 2x plus 15. So taking minus 1 out of the common factor of the first two terms, I get x squared minus 2x. I've still got plus 15 on the end. So that gives me minus 1, x minus 1 squared, half the middle term, and then take away minus 1 squared. I've still got plus 15. So that gives me minus 1, x minus 1 squared, take away 1, plus 15, which is minus x minus 1 squared. Minus 1 times minus 1 is 1, so 1 plus 15 is 16. And that's it in complete square form. C says another function h of x is 1 over f of g of x. What values of x cannot be in the domain of h? So part C, h of x is 1 over f of g of x, which we'll just complete the square of. So it's 1 over minus x minus 1 squared plus 16, or otherwise. But the denominator cannot be 0. So we can just write that. For the domain, for that to be valid, the denominator cannot be zero. So that implies minus x minus one squared. So 
So try to solve that equal to zero to see what it, that gives me for it when it is zero, I can then say x can't be these numbers. So we've already completed the square, so we can just say minus x minus one squared equals minus 16. Divided by minus one means x minus one squared equals 16. Square root on both sides, then you get x minus one equals four or minus four. So that means x either equals 4 plus 1 is 5, or x equals minus 4 plus 1 is minus 3. That means x cannot equal 5, or x cannot equal minus 3, and we're done there. Three higher maths 2019, paper 1, question 2. The equation x squared plus k minus 5x plus 1 has equal roots. Determine the values, possible values of k. Well, if it's got equal roots, that means that we write for equal roots, that implies b squared minus 4ac equals 0. So our a is the number in front of x squared, our b is k minus 5, the number in front of x, and our c is just 1. So for b squared minus 4ac, we get k minus 5 squared minus 4 times 1 for a times 1 for c equals 0. Expanding k minus 5 all squared gives me k squared. Minus 5 times 2 is minus 10, so minus 10k. 5 fives is 25. And then we've got 4 times 1 times 1 is 4 equals 0. So that's k squared minus 10k. 25 minus 4 is 21 equals 0. And if we're lucky, that will factorise. So we've got k and k, 7 threes is 21 and 7 and 3 make 10, so it's definitely 7 and 3, minus 7 minus 3 is minus 10, so k equals 3 or k equals 7, and we're done there. Okay, looking at the discriminant, S3 Higher Maths 2016, paper 2, question 2. Find the range of values of p such that this x squared minus 2x plus 3 minus p equals 0 has no real roots. So, no real roots. That means for no real roots, we can say that that implies that b squared minus 4ac is going to be less than 0. So our a is equal to the number in front of x squared, so that's 1. Our b is the number in front of x, so that's minus 2. And our c is 3 minus p. So subbing that in, we get minus 2 squared minus 4 times 1 times 3 minus p is less than 0. So that's 4 minus 4 times 3 minus p. That's 4 minus 12 minus times a minus is a plus, so plus 4p. And then that's pretty simple to solve. 4 minus 12 is minus 8 plus 4p is less than 0, so 4p must be less than 8, and therefore p is less than 2. 8 divided by 4 is 2, and we're done there. Determinant S3 Higher Maths 2018, paper 2, question 10. The equation m squared plus m minus 3x plus m equals 0 has two real and distinct roots determining the values, the range of values for m. So two real distinct roots. That implies that b squared minus 4ac must be greater than 0. So in this case, our a is the number in front of x squared, which is 1. Our b is the number in front of x, which is m minus 3. And our c is what's left at the end, which is just m. So being careful subbing this in, we get m minus 3 all squared minus 4 times 1 times m is greater than 0. So we need to then expand our brackets. So that is m squared minus 6m plus 9. And then 4 times 1 is 4 times m. So minus 4m is greater than 0. So that gives me m squared minus 10m plus 9 is greater than 0. So we need to examine the roots. So looking at the roots, we can try and factorise this. We've got double brackets. 
m and m, 9 and 1, minus 9, minus 1, gives you minus 10. So the roots have m equal to 1 and m equal to 9. And now we need to draw a graph to examine when is the inequality greater than 0. So that's why we look at the roots. So we draw a quick graph. We put our roots on at 1 and 9. We know that the shape goes down the way because it's a positive m squared, so we can just draw a quick sketch of a graph. It doesn't have to be anything too fancy. And we're looking at when it's greater than zero, so I'm looking at when it's above the x-axis. So using a different colour pen, it's above the x-axis over here, and it's above the x-axis over here. In other words, when m is less than one, or when m is greater than 9. And that's our final answer. Okay, looking at quadratic inequalities. S square higher maths 2015, paper 1, question 8. A, B, C, D is a rectangle with lengths x and x minus 2, as shown. If the area is less than 15, determine the range of values of x. Well, area is length times height. So I'll just write that down, or length times breadth, if you prefer. So our length is x and that's x minus 2, and it says that that area has to be less than 15, so I just write x, x minus 2 is less than 15 to set up my inequality. Expanding my brackets, I get x squared minus 2x is less than 15. I've got a quadratic, so I need to take the 15 to the other side, and we need to then find out the roots and draw a graph to see where it's less than 0. So looking at the roots of this, We've got x squared minus 2x minus 15. If that's factorizable, hopefully, we get x and x. 5 and 3. Minus 5 plus 3 is minus 2. So roots are x equal to minus 3 or x equal to 5. So that means we can draw a quick sketch at the side. Minus 3 is over here and 5 is over here somewhere positive x squared, so our quadratic looks something like that, and it just has to be a quick sketch. Now we're looking to see where it's less than zero, where it's less than zero below the x-axis, so that is in between these two numbers, minus 3 is less than x is less than 5, but we need to be careful with this question because it is about the area of a rectangle, so we can't have a negative length x must be let's have a look we've got x minus 2 is our smallest so it has to be bigger than 2 or the breadth would be negative and therefore our actual answer is 2 is less than x is less than 5 Need to be very careful with ones where it's in context. Let's go higher maths, paper one, question three. Circle C1 has this equation and C2 has center four minus two. The radius of C2 is equal to the radius of C1. Find the equation of circle C2. So we have got our equation up here and just remember Form our equation, x squared plus y squared minus 2, 6 minus 2y minus 26 equals 0. You're given at the start of the exam paper the radius. The radius is quoted as equaling the square root of g squared plus f squared minus c. And your g and your f, well this is called 2g and 2f. So 2g is minus 6 and 2f is minus 2. So my g is minus 3 and my f is minus 1. So my radius is equal to minus 3 squared plus minus 1 squared. Take away c, but it's a minus already, so plus 26. So that means that going down here, my radius is equal to the square root of 9 plus 1 plus 26. That's the square root of 36, which is equal to 6. So we've got our radius. And we know the circle centre is 4 minus 2. 
So we know the equation of C2 must equal x minus 4 squared plus y plus 2 squared equals 36. And we're done there. This we have 2016 paper 1 question 4 on the circle. A and B are points 7 minus 3 and 1, 5. Let's just take a note of that. So there's A, minus 7, 3, and B is 1, 5. Find the equation of a circle. So for the equation of a circle, we need two things. We need the centre and the radius. So where's the centre? It's in the middle of these two points. So the midpoint of A and B. Let's just call that midpoint of A and B. We add the x parts, minus 7 plus 1 over 2. We add the y parts, 3 plus 5 over 2. Minus 7 plus 1 is minus 6. Divided by 2 is minus 3. And 3 plus 5 is 8. Divided by 2 is 4. So we've got a midpoint. We now need our radius. So to get our radius, we use the distance formula. So we now know we've got minus 3 and 4. So the distance, let's just call this m. The distance between m and say b is Pythagoras, the square root of minus 3 minus 1 squared plus 4 minus 5 squared, or the other way around. That's the square root of minus 4 squared plus minus 1 squared. That's the square root of 16 plus 1 is 17. So the distance is 17. So now using the start of our exam paper, x minus a squared plus y minus b squared equals r squared. So our centre is minus 3, 4. So that's x plus 3 squared plus y minus 4 squared equals root 17 squared, which is just 17. And we're done there. Hey, SQA Higher Maths 2018, paper 1, question 4. The point k lies in the circle with this equation. Find the equation of a tangent to the circle at k. Tangent meets a radius at right angles. So we need to find the centre of our circle. So we've got it in expanded form. So from the start of the exam paper, we are told that x squared plus y squared plus 2gx plus 2fx plus c equals 0 is the equation of a circle where the centre is equal to minus g minus f and the radius is equal to the square root of g squared plus f squared minus c. So looking up at our equation, the number in front of f, 2g is minus 12. And the number in front of y, 2f is minus 6. So that gives me g is minus 12 divided by 2 minus 6. And it gives me f is minus 6 divided by 2 minus 3. So our centre is just simply 6, 3. Once we've got our centre, we can find the gradient between our centre. Let's just call our centre C. So the gradient between C and K is minus 5 take away 3 on the top and 8 take away 6 on the bottom. Minus 5 take away 3 is minus 8 over 2, which is minus 4. So the gradient of our perpendicular equals a quarter since M1 times M2 equals minus 1. So our point is 8 minus 5 for k. So we can use y minus b, y plus 5 equals m x minus a, which is 8. Times the through by 4, we get 4 times y plus 5 equals x minus 8. So 4y plus 20 is x minus 8, or to leave it in a nice way, 4y minus x equals minus 28 would be a fine answer. If you prefer y equals, you can divide through by 4 to get y equals a quarter of x, and then minus 28 divided by 4 is minus 7, if you prefer. Let's go higher maths 2015, paper 1, question 11, for the equation of a tangent to a curve. Question 11 says the point t minus 2 minus 5 lies in the circumference of the circle with this equation. Find the equation of the tangent to the circle through T. For part A, so the part A is a circle question, and part B says the tangent is also a tangent to a parabola with that equation to determine the value of P. So let's do part A, circles. The centre of our circle is just minus 8, minus 2. Minus 8 and minus 2. And we've also got our point T, 
which is minus 2, minus 5. So if we work out our gradient, if we want to draw a circle for this, there's our C, there's our T, say, out here. That meets the tangent at right angles. So the gradient between C and T is perpendicular to the, the tangent. So the gradient of CT is equal to minus 5 minus minus 2 over minus 2 minus minus 8. Minus 5 add 2 is minus 3. Minus 2 add 8 is 6. That's equal to minus a half. Therefore, the gradient of the tangent is 2 since m1 times m2 equals minus 1. And then our point, remember, is minus 2 minus 5, so y minus minus 5 equals 2x minus minus 2. So y plus 5 equals 2x plus 4, or y equals 2x minus 1. And we've got the equation of our tangent. Our b says the tangent is also a tangent to a parabola of equation y equals minus 2x squared plus px plus 1 minus p where p is bigger than 3, find the value of p. Well, if it's a tangent to that parabola, it means that y equals 2x minus 1 goes into this, so we can just equate them in simultaneous equations. So we can just say that 2x minus 1 equals minus 2x squared plus px plus 1 minus p, and solve that equation to get our x. So moving everything over to the left, we get 2x squared, because it's negative. We've got plus 2x, then minus px, and then we've got minus 1, minus another 1, but then plus p, and that would equal 0. Equating all our terms, so we get an x squared x and a number, you get 2x squared. We can factorise x out here, so we've just got x, so it's 2 minus p times x. And then we've got minus 2 plus p equals 0. So we've got a quadratic, but... When you get a quadratic, it only has one solution or it only touches at one point when the discriminant equals zero. So tangent, therefore b squared minus 4ac equals zero. So our b is 2 minus p, so 2 minus p squared minus 4 times a times c, which is minus 2 add p, equals zero. Multiplying that out, 2 twos is 4, minus 2 times p is 2p, so minus 4p plus p squared. And then you've got 4 times 2 is 8, so it's minus 8 times minus 2 plus p. So you get 4 minus 4p plus p squared plus 16 minus 8p equals 0. So p squared and then our p terms, we've got a minus 8 minus 4 is minus 12p. And then our constant terms, 16 plus 4 is 20, equals 0. So we've got a quadratic to solve it. We can now factorise, hopefully. If that equals 0, then we get p and p. 10 and 2 to make 12 in the middle. And it'll be minus 10 and minus 2. So p equals 2 or p equals 10. But if you go back to the original question, it says p is greater than 3. So we can disregard that one. So p equals 10 is our final answer. The intersection of lines and circles again. The line 3x intersects the circle of equation x minus 2 squared plus y minus 1 squared equals 25. Find the coordinates of the point of intersection. So if they intersect, it means we're solving them simultaneously to see these points. So y equals 3x is our first equation. And when we'll write down our circle equation, x minus 2 squared plus y minus 1 squared equals 25. So to solve these simultaneously, we use substitution. We know that y is 3x, so we'll replace the y with 3x in this equation. So we've got x minus 2 squared plus 3x minus 1 squared equals 25. Multiplying out our brackets to get a quadratic then, we've got x squared minus 4x plus 4 for the first bracket, and then we've got 3 threes is 9x squared, 3 ones is 3, double that is 6, so minus 6x plus 1, and then I'll just take away 25 and make it equal to 0 because I'm going to get a quadratic. 
If you're struggling with multiplying out these brackets, you can just take your time and multiply them out any way you want. So we've got x squared and 9x squared is 10x squared minus 10x. 4 plus 1 is 5 minus 25 is negative 20 equals 0. 10 is a common factor. x squared minus x minus 2. So 10, hopefully it's factorizable. 2 and 1. Um, we want to get minus 1, so it's minus 2 plus 1 is minus 1. Minus 2 times 1 is minus 2. So x equals minus 1 or x equals 2. We've got our x point, now we need to get our y point. So when y equals 3x, x equal to minus 1, y equals minus 3, the point is minus 1 minus 3. And for y equal to 3x, when x equals 2, y equals 6. So our point is 2, 6. There's our two points of contact. And we're done there. We have Math 23, paper 2, question 15. The last one, the line x plus 3y equals 17 is a tangent to a circle at the point 2, 5. And it also says the center of the circle lies on the y-axis. So if we imagine this is a y-axis here, somewhere that center is on that y-axis. So now it asks us to find the coordinates of the center of the circle. This is quite a tricky one, this one, but let's just start doing with it. Let's our center here. We know that this, the radius meets the tangent at right angles. So if I knew the gradient here, I would automatically know this. So let's start on that point. We've got x plus 3y equals 17. 3y then equals minus x plus 17, y equals minus a third of x plus 17 over 3. The gradient of that is minus a third, and therefore the gradient of the perpendicular is equal to 3 because m1 times m2 equals minus 1. We also know that the center of the circle lies on the y axis. So if it lies on the y axis, it goes along zero. So if I draw an x-axis in, we don't know where this x-axis is, so I'm not going to put it there. But that's like our x-axis. It goes along zero and up some number, call it c. But we know our gradient is three, and we've got two points, so we can use the gradient formula and work out our c. So let's just do that. We've got zero c, and we've got two five. So y2 minus y1, 5 minus c equals 2 over 2 minus 0 equals our gradient of 3. So we've got 5 minus c over 2 equals 3. 5 minus c equals 6. So I'll just take the 5 over minus c equals 6 minus 5, 6 plus 5. Minus c equals 6 minus 5, which is 1. So c equals minus 1. So the center of the circle is simply 0, minus 1, and we're done there. Okay, SQA Higher Math 2016, paper 1, question 8. The intersection of lines and circles this time. Show that the line with equation y equals 3x minus 5 is a tangent to the circle with this equation and find the coordinates of the point of contact. So if it is a tangent, it means this y is equal to the y in here. So I can substitute this into this equation. So I've got x squared plus 3x minus 5 squared plus 2x minus 4 times 3x minus 5 minus 5 equals 0. So multiplying out our brackets, we get x squared plus 3 threes are 9, so 9x squared 3 fives is 15 times 2 is 30, so minus 30x plus 25 plus 2x. 4 threes is 12, so minus 12x. 4 fives is 20, so plus 20, then minus 5 equals 0. So you're going to get a quadratic. So we've got x squared plus 9x squared is 10x squared. Minus 30x plus 2x is minus 28x. 
minus 12x is minus 40x. And then we've got our number part, 25 plus 20 is 45 minus 5 is 40. And we know that that equals 0. So we can solve that by taking 10 out as a common factor to get x squared minus 4x plus 4 equals 0. And then let's solve it. Now we're looking if it's a tangent for only one solution because it only touches it at one point. So this should be equal roots. So let's check x and x. 2 twos is 4, so minus 2 minus 2 equals 0. So we can say that it's got equal roots. So only one point of contact. Therefore, the line is a tangent to the circle. Find the coordinates of the point of contact. Well, we've already got this equation equal to zero, so that implies that x equals two. And then subbing that back in to get a y, well, we might as well just use our original equation, y equals 3x minus 5. So we've got y equals 3 times 2 minus 5. 6 minus 5 is 1, so we've got 1 and 2. So our point of contact is 2, 1. And we're done there. A Grade 2022 Paper 1, Question 14, the final one of the paper, this one, and it was a circle question. It says circle 1 as equation x minus 7 squared plus y plus 5 squared, and it equals 100. State the centre and radius of the circle, and then hence or otherwise show that the point minus 2, 7 lies outside the circle. Part B is another circle with centre P and R. Determine the values where C1 and C2 have one point of intersection. Okay, so there's our formula sheet for circles that you didn't have to memorise, although you should probably know it by now, but it tells us the centres quite clearly. We've got 7 minus 5 as our centre for one mark. So for part A1, all we had to do was write down 7 minus 5, and that gives us a mark for our centre. And then remember, looking at the formula sheet, we can work out the radius, because if it's in already factorised form, the right-hand side equals r squared, so we can write down r squared equals 100, therefore r equals 10, because it's the square root of 100, for our second mark. Nice, and nice to start off with there. So let's move on to part two of the question, and zoom a little bit. Part two says, hence or otherwise show the point minus two, seven lies outside of cent circle centre one. Well, we can just substitute point P into the circle and check does it actually equal 100 or not. So, part two. So our P equals minus two and seven, which is our X and Y. So we've got for one mark, substituting that in, minus two, take away seven, squared plus seven plus five squared is minus nine, all squared plus 12, all squared, that's 81 plus 144, which equals two, two, five. So that's our third mark of the first mark of part two. For substituting in and working out it equals 225, we get a mark. Then we need to actually say what that means. So we can say that since 225 is bigger than 100, P must be outside the circle. Since 225 is bigger than 100, P lies outside the circle. And there we are for the next mark. So we've got four marks already. 11 part B says that C2 is a circle with centre P and radius R. Determine the values for which C1 and C2 have exactly one point of intersection. So you've got two options. If I draw a circle here, then we'll call this C2. And that's centre is P, which if we remind ourselves was minus 2, 7. And then we've got our first circle, let's call it C1. If we move that over so it's touching the centre of that circle, 
was 7 minus 5. So if we're touching at one point, we're just touching externally, so that the radius, this is called R1 plus R2, would be the distance between the circles. So R1 plus R2 would be the distances. Now we know that this radius for our first circle is already 10. We don't know the radius of our second circle, but we can work out the distance between the circles. So using the distance formula, R1 plus R2 equals x2 minus x1, 7 minus minus 2 is 9 squared, minus 5 minus 7, so plus 12 squared. 9 squared plus 12 squared is 225, which makes 15. The distance between the circles is 15. So that means the radius R1, in this case, would be 5 because 5 plus 10 is 15. So that's one option. But okay, so for the second option, we could have the two circles inside each other. And in that case, well, we already know that the radices together make 15. So the distance between these two circles is 15. But we already also know one other piece of information, that the radius of one of our circles is 10 and therefore the radius of our other circle 10 plus 15 is 25 r1 could be 25 for our second mark so we get two marks one for getting r1 equals to 5 and the other one for communicating that it must be 25 3 high in maths 2023, paper 2, question 11. Circle C1 has this equation and C2 has that equation. Find the distance between the centres for part A. So again, look at the start of our exam paper. It tells us that it's x minus a plus x minus b, y minus b squared equals 37. So the centre of C1 is just 4, opposite of minus 4, and minus 2, the opposite of 2. For the centre of C2, so if we examine C2, first of all, it is minus g minus f, where that is 2g and 2f. So we know that 2g equals 2 and 2f equals minus 6. So g is equal to 1 and f is equal to minus 3. So our centre of C2 is just minus g minus f minus 1, 3. So now we want the distance between them. So it's the distance formula all the way with Pythagoras. The difference between the x squared plus the difference between the y squared. So the distance is just going to equal the square root of, we've got 4 minus minus 1 squared plus minus 2 minus 3 squared. That is equal to 4 minus minus 1 is 5, so 5 squared. Minus 2 minus 3 is also 5, so 5 squared or minus 5 squared if you prefer. 25 plus 25 is root 50. You can simplify that as a third if we want, or just place root 50 in our calculator if you don't want to mess about with thirds. That is a calculator paper after all. But root 25, root 2, root 25 is 5, so we can leave it as 5 root 2, or put it in our calculator. Part B says, hence show that C1 and C2 intersect at two distinct points. So we already know that the distance between the centres is 5 root 2. Now, if you had put that in a calculator, you would get an answer of 7.07. .07. So I'm just going to note that for now. And then for part B, to work out whether they intersect at one point, two points, or no points, you need to examine the distance between the radiuses. So I'm going to need my radius of C1 and C2. So the radius of C1 is equal to the square root of 37, because it equals r squared. The radius of C2 is given by the square root of g plus f minus c. g squared plus f squared minus c squared minus c. So the radius of C2 is equal to the square root of, remember g and f are 1 and minus 3, so it's just 1 squared plus minus 3 squared. Take away c, which is the number on the end, minus minus 7. So it's minus minus 7. So that is 1 times 1 is 1, 3 3s are 9, 
minus minus seven is plus seven. Plus seven, and nine plus one is 10, plus seven is root 17. So the distance between the centers is the radius is, is the, so the radius is C2, it's just root 17. And we've got root 37 for C1. So we might as well turn them into numbers and add them together, because if you add up the radiuses and it's bigger than the distance between the centers, it means it touches at two distinct points. So I was in that point. Let's say we have two circles. You've got two options. You can, we could touch like this, or we could touch like that, or I suppose we could be that. Those are all options with internal each other, but that's your main ones. If you look at the centers here, it's easy to see from the ones that don't touch. If that distance there, the distance between the centers is bigger, that is obviously bigger than the radiuses, so we don't touch. That distance here is clearly the same as this, the, the radiuses added together, so we touch on the one point. That distance there then must be shorter than the radiuses added together. Or in other words, the radius added together is bigger than the distance between the centers. They touch at two distinct points. So all we need to do is check what R1 plus R2 is. So R1 plus R2 equals root 37 plus root 17, so you get your calculator out, and that gives you 10.02. So since 10.02 is greater than 7.07, .07, the distance between the centres, the circles touch at two distinct points. Now we're done there. S-grade higher maths, 15 paper 3, question 5. Circle C1 has equation x squared plus y squared plus 6x plus 10y plus 9 equals 0. And the centre of C2 is 9, 11. There's C2 there, so let's just call that 9, 11. And the touch, determine the radius of C2. Well, we'll just find out all we can, so let's see if we can find the, the centre of C1. We have got this equation here. And we know from the start of the exam paper that minus g minus f is the circle's centre. So to get minus g minus f, you just divide these by 2 and change the sign. So that becomes 3, 5. So that's minus 3, minus 5. So we can write that for that centre. What else do we know? Well, we also know the radius of C1. So if we knew the radius of C1 and maybe this whole distance, we could find the radius of C2. So let's do the whole distance first. So the distance between, let's call it C1 and C2. Distance formula is Pythagoras, so it's 9 minus minus 3 squared, the x's, plus 11 minus minus 5 squared. That equals the square root of 12 squared plus 16 squared. That is 400, which gives me 20. So we now know the distance all the way up here is 20. So let's now find the radius of circle C1. So again, start of the exam paper, radius is equal to the square root of g squared plus f squared minus c. So we know g and f are just our centres. So therefore we can say the radius of C1 or R1 is equal to the square root of 3 squared is g plus 5 squared is f, minus c, which is minus 9. So that is 9 plus 25 minus 9 is 25. So therefore, the radius r1 is equal to 5 units. So we now know, I'll just use a different colour, that from here to here is 5. And therefore, from there to there must be 15. Therefore, r2 equals... 20 minus 5, which is 15, and we're done there. So it now says, for part B, a third circle is C3 is drawn such that C1 and C2 touch internally with C3, and the centres of C1, C2, C3 are collinear, so we line up in a straight line. And we have to determine the equation of C3. A little sketch to illustrate this will be handy for you. This point here is minus 3, minus 5, and we know that the other point is 9, 11 here. And we want to know 
where the center of the big circle is and therefore what its radius is. So we're kind of looking at this line going through. Now we know the radius as well of C1 is 5, so we know that this line here is 10. We only got 5 on this side and 5 on that side. And we also know the radius of our big circle now is 15, or our big one in the middle. So that's 15 and 15. So we can use ratio to see how how much the line divides the circles. So we can you should be able to see that a center of the big circle, if I just kind of drop there, is kind of roughly there. So if I kind of mark that point, that's the center of like C3 roughly there. And we need to know where that is. So let's see how we divide this up. So if I kind of just draw a right angle triangle here, there it is. You can see that this distance is going from minus 3 all the way over to 9. So that's 12. And we can see that this distance is from minus 5 all the way up to 11. So that's 16. So the diameter of a big circle is 30 plus 10, which is 40. So the radius of a big circle is 20. So we know that from the big circle from here to there is 20. Or I'll just write that, the radius of 3 is 20 at the side. So we know that this bit here is like 5. So this bit in here must be 10 because it goes 10 plus another 10 makes 20. So that must be 10 in there. So if we think about moving from here to here, we move 15 units. And then from here to here, we move 5 units. So the ratio is 3 to 1. So if we divide 12 by 4, we get this line must be 3. And if we divide 16 by 4, this line up here must be 4. That must be a 3, 4, 5 triangle there. So then we can get the centre just by working backwards from 9, 11. It's taking 9, 11. Our centre, which I'll just do in a different colour. 9 minus 3 is 6. And 11 minus 4. 7. So we get our centre of our circle finally is 6, 7. So we've got our centre and we've got our radius. So the equation is x minus 6 squared plus y minus 7 squared equals 20 squared. And we're done there. Or we can say x minus 6 squared plus y minus 7 squared equals 400. Okay, unusual circle questions, SQA, higher math, 2019, paper 1, question 16, had this one. P is the point with coordinates 4K, and C is the centre of the circle with this equation. Show the distance between P and C is given by square root of K squared plus 4K plus 13. So part A, we've got our points, 4 and K, and the centre of our circle is equal to, well, let's have a look. We've got 1 minus 2. So we can work out the distance between them. That is going to be the square root of the difference in the x's, 4 minus 1 squared, plus the difference in the y's, k minus minus 2 squared. Tidying that up, we get the square root of 3 squared plus k plus 2 squared. That equals the square root of 9 plus k squared plus 4k plus 4 which equals the square root of k squared plus 4k plus 13, as required. Part B says, hence I'll always find the range of values of k such that p lies outside the circle. So let's draw a little picture for this. We've got a circle, and the centre of that circle is 1 minus 2. And we can look to see what the radius is. We know the radius is 5, the square root of 25. So that distance is 5, that's our radius. So if P is outside the circle, then clearly the distance between the center and P must be bigger than 5. It has to be over 5. So we can then just say that the square root of K squared plus 4K plus 13 is greater than 5. And we can go from there. That's because our radius, remember, is 5. So quadratic inequality, square both sides, k squared plus 4k plus 13 is greater than 25. Taking the 25 over, we get k squared plus 4k minus 12 is greater than 0. And this is a quadratic inequality, so we examine the roots. So looking at our roots, we've got k squared plus 4k minus 12 is equal to 0. Double brackets, we get k and k, 6 and 2 
plus 6 minus 2 is 4. So our roots have them at k equal to 2, or k equals minus 6. Drawing a quick sketch then of that graph, we get 2 over here somewhere, minus 6 over here. It's a positive k squared, so it is a happy face. We don't need the turning point or anything because we're just looking to see when is this bigger than zero. Well, it's bigger than zero above the x-axis, so it's over this side, it's always bigger than zero, and over this side, it's always bigger than zero as well. So our final answer is k is less than minus six, or k is bigger than two. And we're done there. Basically, higher maths 2019, paper 2, question 2, integrate this polynomial. So we need to get it ready to integrate, just like with differentiation. So I'm going to change that to the integral of 6x to the half minus 4x to the minus 3 plus 5. And then we can integrate because we add 1 to the power and divide by the new power. So that gives me x to the 3 halves. Still times 6, but that's divided by 3 halves. We'll deal with that later. And then minus 4x to the minus 2. Minus 3 add 1 is minus 2. So divide by minus 2. Then plus 5x. And then remember to add your c. Okay, dividing by a fraction is the same as times by its reciprocal. So I can just do 6 times 2 is 12. So that's 12 over 3. x to the 3 halves. 4 divided by 2 is 2, minus divided by a minus is a plus, so plus 2x to the minus 2, plus 5x, plus c. 12 divided by 3 is 4, so that's 4x to the 3 over 2, plus 2x to the minus 2, plus 5x, plus c. And you would get your final mark at that stage, but let's just assume you wanted to go further, because you're going to use it in a, another question. This helps us revise indices. Um, so we've got x to the 3 halves, so that's the same as x to the square root, because of the 2, x cubed, plus 2, x to the minus 2, over x squared, plus 5x, plus c. But you don't need to go that far for this question. x to the higher maths, 2023, paper 1, question 6. Integrate 2x to the power of 5, minus 6, root x, dx, for x greater than equal to 0. So integration without limits means there's going to be a plus c. But I need to get it ready to def integrate root x becomes x to the half. So I'm going to integrate integrate 2x to the 5 minus 6x to the half dx. So integrate, add 1 to the power, divide by the new power. So x to the 5 becomes x to the 6, and I've got 2 sixths minus 6x. Add 1 to a half, you get 3 halves. So I have to divide by 3 halves, and I've still got plus c. So dealing with the first one is easy, 2 6 is a third, so we've got a third x to the 6. Divided by a fraction, same as times and by its reciprocal, so times by it and then turn it upside down. So I've got minus 6 times 2 thirds, x to the 3 halves plus c. So that gives me 1 third of x to the 6. 6 twos are 12. 12 divided by 3 is 4, so minus 4x to the 3 halves plus c for our final answer. Big function with the chain rule. S grade higher maths 2016 paper 1 question 5. Integrate 8 cos 4x add 1 dx. Cos goes to sine, check the start of the exam paper. So that equals 8 sine, the whole function 4x plus 1. But then I need to differentiate 4x plus 1. Well, that's 4 and divide by that. So divided by 4. And don't remember, forget your plus c. 8 divided by 4 is 2. So we get 2 sine 4x plus 1 plus c. And we're done. Let's go to higher maths 2023 paper 2 question 3. Integrate 7 cos 4x plus pi over 3 dx. So we're going to use the chain rule here because we've got an inner function. So integrate cos, well, cos goes to sine using the start of the exam paper. So that integral straight away becomes 7 sine 4x plus pi over 3. But then we need to divide by the inner function differentiated. So differentiate 4x, you get 4 
pi over 3 is nothing. So it's just 4. And then we've got plus C, remember? Don't forget the plus C. We could leave it like that, but I'm just going to tidy that up slightly by taking the fraction outside. So we get 4x plus pi over 3 plus C. And we're done there. SQA, higher maths 2022, paper 1, question 6. Integrate between minus 5 and 2, 10 minus 3x to the power of minus a half dx. Okay, let's start working on this. So we've got the integral of minus 5 and 2 of 10 minus 3x to the power of minus a half dx. Well, we could start to integrate this by adding 1 to the power. So we've got 10 minus 3x to the power of a half. We then need to divide by the bit inside the brackets differentiated. So inside the brackets is 10 minus 3x. If we differentiate that, you get minus 3. So we need to divide by minus 3, or in other words, that's the same as times it by minus a third. You get your first mark for just starting to do that, and you get your second mark for showing anywhere that you are going to be dividing by minus 3 or times and by minus a third. So there's your first two marks there. And then we need to process our limits. So we let's tidy this up a little bit before we get to that. So we get 10 minus 3x to the power of a half. Dividing by a half is the same as times and by 2. We've got a minus because of the times and by minus a third divided by 3. Now, our limits are 2 and minus 5. So we've got minus 2, 10 times minus 3 to the, times 2 to the power of a half divided by 3. There's our first limit, and that is minus, minus 2, 10, minus 3 times minus 5 to the power of a half divided by 3. So there's our two limits because it's between minus 5 and 2. So your third mark is actually coming in at this point for substituting in 2 and minus 5 and putting the minus in between you are getting that mark. So there's your third mark there. And then your final mark is for actually working that out. So let's work that out now. Just being very careful. So we've got minus two, 10 minus six is four. So it's times the square root of four because the power of a half is square root in, divided by three. And that's minus, and then we've got Minus 2 again, 10 minus 3 times minus 5, well, that's minus 3 times minus 5 is 15, so that's 10 add 15, which is 25. So it's times the square root of 25 over 3. Working out that, we get minus 2 times 2, which is minus 4 thirds, minus minus 2 times 5, which is minus 10 thirds. Minus 4 plus 10 is 6, so that's 6 thirds, which is equal to 2 in the end. So if you can get down to getting 2, there's your final mark there for working that out. Okay, let's go through some key points of where you could go wrong in this question. If you differentiated and didn't integrate, unfortunately you get no marks at all, even if you're substituting numbers in, there's no way to get any marks for that. If you start to integrate individual terms, if we go back to the standard, the, the actual question, if you're trying to integrate, say, the 10 to get, like, 10x, and then the minus 3x to get something like minus 3 over 2x, you're just doing it inside the bracket, or you're trying to expand the bracket, you can't get any, any more marks after that as well, because it's just invalid, it doesn't work. For mark 4 down here, uh, it's only available for non-integer power. So in other words, if your power here, I've got a half as the correct answer, if you'd use squared or cubed or 4, that we wouldn't get a mark because we're checking if you can do the third part as well. Okay, integrating a trig function again with a chain rule, we've got higher maths, 2019, paper 1, question 11. Evaluate the integral between 0 and pi over 9 of cos 3x minus pi over 6 dx. Exact value question as well because it's non-calculator. So let's start integrating. That becomes cos goes to sine, remember? We're looking at the start of the exam paper. The whole function 3x minus pi over 6. But then we need to 
differentiate this, well that's just a number so that's nothing, that becomes 3, so divide by 3. And that is the integral between 0 and pi over 9. Now there's our first step, now we need to just substitute in. So that gives us a third of sine, well, 3 times pi over 9, we'll just write, minus pi over 6. That's our first one. Take away our second one, subbing 0 in. So that's a third, sine 3 times 0 minus pi over 6. Okay, so we can now, we'll just tidy it up, put an extra bracket on. We can now just evaluate that. So that gives me one third. If I take my first one, sine 3 pi over 9. So let's just do this. 3 pi over 9 is pi over 3. So we've got pi over 3. And then our pi over 6, we can think of that as... Minus pi over 6. Take away a third of sine. And then 3 nothings is nothing, so it's just minus pi over 6. So that gives me one third of the sine of, well, pi over 3 is 2 pi over 6. Minus pi over 6 is pi over 6. So we've just got pi over 6 now. Take away a third of the sine of minus pi over 6. So we're going to have to work out what the sine of pi over 6 is. So uh, if you're thinking in degrees, pi over 6 is the same as 180 over 6, which is 30 degrees. So exact value triangles is how I always think of this. So if I got myself a triangle with two on this side, one on that side, then by Pythagoras, 2, 2 is 4, minus 1 is 3, that is root 3. Now that was 60, so that one's 30. The sine of 30 degrees is equal to a half. You might have just memorised that yourself. If you think of a sine graph or a cast diagram, you can see that minus 30 would be about here. It's obviously minus a half for the sine of minus 30 degrees. One third of the sine of 30, so one third times a half, minus one third times minus a half. So a third times a half is a sixth. A third times minus a half is minus a sixth. So plus another sixth because of minus times a minus. That is two sixths. That is one third. And we're done there. Yeah. Getting with chain rule. S square high maths 18, paper one, question 14. Find the integral between nine and minus four of this function. Gonna have to get it ready to differentiate first. So we've got between minus four and nine, one over, so it's the cube root, so that's to the power of a third, but it's squared, so it's to the power of two thirds. So it's 2x plus 9 to the power of two thirds dx, which equals the integral between minus 4 and 9, taking it up to the top, 2x plus 9 to the minus two thirds dx. And now we can integrate it. So we add one to the power and divide by the new power. So being very careful, we've got 2x plus 9. Add 1 is a third. Divide by our new power. So divide by a third, but also divide by this differentiated, which is 2. So I can say times 2 on the top bottom as well. And that is between minus 4 and 9, which I'll substitute in when I'm ready. Now this is a non-calculator question, so I'm going to have to put it back into root form as well. So that gives me 2x plus 9 cube root. So I can just write the cube root of 2x plus 9. 2 times a third is 2 thirds. And that's between minus 4 and 9. 
Almost done. Dividing by a fraction means we can times it by the reciprocal, flip it upside down in other words. So we get 3 times the cube root of 2x plus 9 over 2 between minus 4 and 9. And now I'm ready to substitute my numbers in. So substitute 9 in, take away substitute minus 4 in. So subbing in my numbers, get 3 times the cube root of 2 times 9 plus 9 all over 2. I'll just put that in big brackets. Minus 3 times the cube root of 2 times minus 4 plus 9. I'll just make that clear that that's separate all over 2. And now we can work some of that out. So that's 3 times the cube root of 2 nines is 18, 18 and 9 is 27 over 2, minus 3 times the cube root of 2 times minus 4 is minus 8, add 9 is 1 over 2. And that's handy because that now simplifies quite easily. The cube root of 27, 3 times 3 is 9 times 3 is 27. So this gives, just gives me 3 times 3 over 2 minus cube root of 1 is 1. 3 times 1 over 2. That equals 9 over 2 minus 3 over 2, which equals 6 over 2, which equals 3. And we're done there. Equations S square high maths 2019, paper 2, question 13. A function defined a set of real numbers, it is shown that the rate of change of f with respect to x is given by this equation. The graph of y equals f of x crosses the x-axis at 7, 0, express f of x in terms of x. This question, I suppose, is asking you about if, do you know what rate of change is? Well, rate of change means differentiation. So we know that f dash x equals 3x squared minus 16x plus 11. So that means that f of x is the integral of this. And we'll get to the second bit of information to get c in a minute. So integrating that, we get x cubed times 3 over 3 minus 16x squared over 2 plus 11x plus c. So there's our initial step. We can simplify that in a moment. But it tells us that the graph of y equals f of x crosses the x-axis at 7, 0. Well, 7 is x and 0 is y. So we can substitute 0 and 7 into our equation. So we've got f of x tidying it up equals x cubed minus 16 over 2 is 8x squared plus 11x plus c. So when x is 7, y is 0. When x equals 7, y which equals f of x, equals 0. So subbing that in, we get 0 equals 7 cubed, minus 8 times 7 squared, plus 11 times 7, plus c. This was a calculator paper, so you could do all the, calcul the sums in, in a calculator, but um, 7 cubed is 343. 7 squared is 49, times 8 is 392. 11 7 is 77, and then we've got plus c, and 0 equals this. Tidying all that up, we get 0 equals 343 minus 392 plus 77 is 28, plus c, and therefore c must equal negative 28. We've got our c, so we'll just sub it back into the equation we just found above, so therefore f of x is equal to our x cubed minus our 8x squared plus 11x minus 28. And we're done there. It's the higher mass 2023 paper 2 question 12. A curve for which the y by the x equals 8x cubed plus 3 passes through minus 1, 3. Find y in terms of x, so a differential equation. And to get the y by dx to get y, but that's going to have plus c, so I'll sub in the point. So y equals the integral of 8x cubed plus 3 dx. So y equals, add 1 to the power, divide by the new power. So 8 over 4 
plus 3x plus c, or y equals 2x to the 4 plus 3x plus c at the point when x equals minus 1, y equals 3. So subbing that in, we'll get 3 equals 2 times minus 1 to the 4 plus 3 times minus 1 plus c. So 3 equals 2 minus 1 to the 4 is 1. 3 times minus 1 is minus 3 plus c. 3 is minus 1 plus c, so c equals 4. And therefore, we just rewrite our equation with the c replaced by the number 4. 2x to the 4 plus 3x plus 4. And we're done there. Potential equations. This we have asked 2015 paper 1, question 15. The rate of change of a mug of coffee is given by this differential equation. It tells you some information. Express t in terms of t. What you need to realise is if you integrate a dt by dt, you just get t back. So we can just immediately say that t equals the integral of the right hand side, 1 over 25 t minus k. And that will be with respect to t because it's dt instead of dx is normal. So we just integrate and let's go. So we get 1 over 25 t squared and then we times by a half because we divide by 2. And then minus k times t but then we've also got plus c. So there is our integral which is tidy that up Dividing by a half, we get 1 over 50 t squared minus kt plus c. So there's our initial step, but then we need to eliminate that c, but luckily we're given some information. It says initially the temperature of the coffee is 100 degrees, 10 minutes later the temperature has fallen to 82 degrees. Express t in terms of t. So, first step, we know that initially when t is 0, the temperature is 100. So we can say that when t equals 0, big T equals 100. Subbing all that in, we get 100 equals 0 minus 0 plus c. In other words, c equals 100. So we've now got t equals 150th of t squared minus kt plus 100. But we need to find this k, so we've got an extra bit of information. 10 minutes later, the temperature is 82. So in other words, when t equals 10, big T equals 82. Subbing that point in, we get 82 equals 150th of 10 squared minus k times 10 plus 100. So we just need to solve and get k back out. 82 equals 100 over 50 minus 10k plus 100. Just quickly running through this, you get 2 minus 10k plus 100. So you get 82 is 102 minus 10k. Moving the 10k over to this side to make it positive, that is 80, 102 minus 82 is 20. So k is 20 over 10, which is 2. So our final answer is just t is equal to 150th of t squared minus 2t because k is 2 then plus 100. And we're done there. Question 4 says the graph has an equation x cubed minus 5x squared plus 2x plus 8. The total shaded area bounded by the curve and the x-axis. We've got this area here and this area here. In the first part of the question, calculate the shaded area above the x-axis, so between minus 1 and 2. So for part A, we need to integrate between minus 1 and 2 our function x cubed minus 5x squared plus 2x plus 8 dx. And that'll give us the area. So when x cubed becomes x to the power of 4 over 4 minus 5x cubed over 3 plus 2x becomes x squared divided by 2 still x squared plus 8x and we're doing that between the limits of minus 1 and 2. So we need to substitute 2 in, take away then substitute minus 1 in. 
So for our first bracket, we've got 2 to the power of 4 over 4 minus 5, 2 cubed over 3 plus 2 squared plus 8 times 2. Take away our second bracket, minus 1 to the power of 4 over 4 minus 5 minus 1 cubed over 3 plus minus 1 squared plus 8 times minus 1. So let's work out each bracket separately and I'm going to keep it as fractions so that our answer is as nice as possible. I'm just using my calculator to get those fractions. So our first one we have got 4 for the first term minus 13 thirds plus 4 plus 16 and we're taking away a quarter plus 5 thirds because it's minus times a minus, plus 1, take away 8. So for the first bracket, we would get 10 and 2 thirds, minus the second bracket, which is minus 5 and a 12. So adding them together, you would get 15 and 3 quarters units squared as our area. Part B then says hence calculate the total shaded area, so we've already got this bit, so we just now need to work out the integral between 2 and 4. And just a reminder when you're wanting to work out an area when it's below as well, you would do this one, take away this one, and that will give you a total area. So for part B, we've got our integral already between minus 1 and 2 of x cubed minus 5x squared plus 2x plus 8 and we're going to take away the integral between 2 and 4 of the same thing x cubed minus 5x squared plus 2x plus 8dx just put that bit in brackets just to separate it out and I'm going to do that bit first I'm going to I've already, I know I already know the answer to this bit Let's just write that down. So that gives us 15 and 3 quarters minus, let's just start integrating now. So we already know the answer to that, so there's no extra work required. It's a quarter x to the 4 minus 5 over 3x cubed plus x squared plus 8x, and that's between 2 and 4. So keeping that 15 and 3 quarters just floating about, minus, let's just use big brackets, let's substitute our 4 in to start with, so we end up with 4 to the power of 4 over 4, minus 5 times 4 cubed over 3, plus 4 squared, plus 8 times 4, so that's our first limit. Take away our second limit, which in this case is 2, so it's a quarter, 2 to the power of 4, minus 5, 2 cubed, over 3, plus 2 squared, plus 8 times 2. 15 and 3 quarters, minus the first bracket, it's 64, minus 106 and 2 thirds, plus 16, plus 32, that's this bracket here, and this bracket we already know the answer to because we did it in part A, so we might as well just write down the answer, that was 10 and 2 thirds, so take away 10 and 2 thirds, fifteen and three quarters, minus, first part of the bracket gives you 5 and a third, minus 10 and 2 thirds. So that means our area is 15 and 3 quarters minus the answer to this, minus 5 and a third. Minus, minus, so it's adding them together, so 15 and 3 quarters plus 5 and a third gives us a final answer of 21 and 112 units 
squared. X squared, hi, I'm asked 23 paper two, question eight. The diagram shows the curve x cubed minus 2x squared minus 4x plus 1, and the line y equals x minus 5, and with the intersect at minus 2 and 1, calculate the shaded area. Now, you can't see the shaded area in this question because of the way it's scanned, but it was the bit in between here. So, the shaded area is between our limits of minus 2 and 1, so integral, because it's an area, between minus 2 and 1 of upper minus lower. So our upper is the curve, x cubed minus 2x squared minus 4x plus 1. Take away our lower, which is the curve, the line, sorry, x minus 5 dx. So that becomes the integral of minus 2 to 1 of x cubed minus 2x squared minus 4x minus x is minus 5x and 1 minus minus 5 is plus 6 dx. So we're integrating, so we add 1 to the power divided by the new power. So that gives us x to the 4 over 4, minus 2x cubed over 3, minus 5x squared over 2, plus 6x, and that's between minus 2 and 1. So now we need to substitute. So substituting our limits, our first limit is 1, so it's 1 to the 4 over 4, minus 2 times 1 cubed over 3, minus 5 times 1 squared over 2, plus 6 times 1. Quickly run out of space, so I'll put my minus here, and then put minus 2 in, we get minus 2 to the power of 4 over 4, minus 2 times minus 2 cubed over 3, minus 5 times minus 2 squared over 2, plus 6 times minus 2. Now usually at this point, depending on the mark scheme, you're only going to get one mark, usually more, after you've substituted. So, if you get really stuck here, just move on. But let's just try and get it, okay? So, that gives us, being very careful, the first term, 1, 4 over 4, is just a quarter for the first bracket. 1 cubed is 1, so I get minus 2 thirds. 1 squared is 1, so I get minus 5 halves. And plus 6. I'm not going to bother trying to add these fractions. I'm going to use a calculator. Minus, minus 2 to the 4. 2 2 is a 4 times 2 is 8 times 2 is 16. So I get 16 over 4, which is 4. 2 2 is a 4 times 2 is 8 times 2 is 16. So I get minus 16 plus 16, sorry, over 3, because it's minus times a minus. 2 2 is a 4, 4 5 is a 20. So minus 20 over 5, minus 20 over 2, sorry. Or you could have written 10. And then 6 twos are 12. So now it's calculator time if you've not got me already. Okay, calculator. Fraction, brackets and fractions. So you open a bracket, use your fraction button, one quarter minus, make sure you use the arrow if you have to, minus two thirds, minus five halves, plus six. So there's my first bracket. And then our second bracket, I've got minus 4 plus 16 over 3, arrow minus 20 over 2, arrow minus 12, close the bracket, press equals. I'm getting 15.75, so I'm going to write 15.75 square units. 15.75 is a fine answer. You can leave it as a decimal. That's completely fine. If you had done it without a calculator or your calculator gives you answers in fractions, you may have got an answer of or, um, 15 and 3 quarters. So you could have got 15 and 3 quarters. Or 15 fours is 60 plus 3 is 63. 63 over 4 would be another answer. Mr. Clare here from Clare Maths. Today we're going to be looking at a paper, 2015 paper two, question four of the SQA Higher Maths exam paper. Let's jump straight in. Okay, this one was about a wall plaque made to commemorate the 150th anniversary of the publication of Alice in Wonderland. Okay, 
So the edges of a wall plaque are modelled by quadratic functions. And there's one, two, three, four, and it gives you four bullet point equations. So what makes this one difficult is that it'll give you all these equations, all this information, but you just need to keep your head. So let's look at part A. Find the coordinate of the point of intersection of the graphs of y equals f of x and y equals g of x. So point of inter intersection means simultaneous equations. So the two ones I need are this one and this one. Since we, that would equal y and y, so I can just make both of these equal to each other. So to get one mark for part a, I'll just do here. I can just write a quarter x squared minus a half x plus three equals a quarter x squared minus three over two x plus five. And that'll give you your first mark. Okay, now we need to solve that to get the x part. And it only asks for the x part, so that's good. Notice if you've got the same thing on both sides, they just automatically cancel. So immediately I can just get like a red pen or something and go, that's the same as that. Same sign and everything, so I can cancel them. I've got minus a half x, so I can add three halves x to both sides. And that will get rid of it on this side. So let's just do that and do it in stages. Three halves take away one half is two halves, which is one. So that just gives us x left on this side plus three equals five. And then we can just solve that to find x, take away three. So x equals two is unlikely as it seems our answer. Part B says the graphs of f of x and h of x intersect on the y-axis. The plaque has a vertical line of symmetry. Calculate the area of the wall pack. You should know a power word for integration is area. So if it says area, you need to integrate and you need to find the two limits. So we've already got our first limit at zero. We need to know this one. Well, this one is going to be the same as this one, which you worked out in part A, where these two intersect was two. So that's just two. So I need to do the integral of the upper f of x minus the lower h of x between 0 and 2. So making sure you're copying it down properly, it's the integral between 0 and 2 of f of x, which is a quarter x squared minus a half x plus 3. Put that in brackets. Take away h of x, which is this one, 3 eighths of x squared minus 9 quarters of x plus 3 dx. So at that point you may be wondering well how much marks do I get? Well at that point you get a mark for knowing to integrate so using the integration sign just that. Another mark for putting in the limits 0 to 2 and then another mark for writing down the two curves taken away from each other. So three marks for literally doing no work. It's not bad that. And then we need to integrate it and you actually only get one further mark for the integration. So all the tidying up you're going to do now, you're not going to get any marks for, but you still need to do it to be able to integrate. So let's tidy this up. So that gives us the integral between 0 and 2. You've got a quarter x squared minus 3 eighths x. So a quarter is 2 eighths. So being very careful, you've got 2 eighths minus 3 eighths. You've got minus an eighth of x squared. Looking at the x parts, you've got minus a half, minus, minus becomes plus, so plus nine quarters. Well, putting a half into quarters is two quarters, so you've got minus two quarters plus nine quarters is seven quarters. So plus seven quarters x. And then we've got our number parts, but they cancel. Three, take away three is nothing. So we get the integral of this between zero and two. And then we need to integrate it, so that gives us x cubed, add 1 to the power and divide by the new power. So 3 times 8 I need to do, which is 24. And then plus x squared, I've got 7 still, but I need to divide by 2. So I've got 4 already on the bottom, so 4 times 2 is 8. And that's between 0 and 2. So that gives us a, another mark at that point. So let's move on and substitute our limits in. So we've got minus 2 cubed over 24 plus 7 times 2 squared over 8. Take away minus 0 cubed over 24 plus 7 times 0 squared 
over 8. Okay, so we get a mark for our substitution. And then we need to evaluate it to get another mark. So we could use a calculator at this point because it is a calculator paper, but I'll just go ahead and do it without. So we've got two twos of four times two is eight over 24. So minus eight over 24. And then the other number, two twos of four, four sevens is 28. So you get 28 over eight. And luckily, you've substituted zero in here, so that is a big fat zero for this. Zero cubed is zero, over that is still zero. Zero squared is zero, over that is still zero. So you just need to work out these fractions. So I can simplify the fractions. Well, actually, I'll, I'll add them first before I simplify, because it'll be easier to see. So minus eight over 24, and then we've got 28 over eight. Eight threes is 24, so times them by three. I get three times 20, so we get 84. So now we can add them, 84 take away eight is 76 over 24. Simplify that, because you have to always have simplified answers. So I'll just divide through by two to get 35, 36, 37, 38 over 12. Divide them by two at the end to get 19 over six. And 19 is a prime number, 6 doesn't go into it, so 19 over 6 is our final answer for another mark. And feel free to do that in any way you want to get 19 over 6, but that isn't the answer. You need to check your question, calculate the area of the wall plaque. Well, we have calculated the area from here to here. So all that bit, if I was to draw a line down here, but you can see it's symmetrical, it even tells you it's symmetrical. So the area of the wall plaque is double the area I just found out. So our final area just to get our final seventh mark, the area, our right total, equals 19 over 6 times 2. 2 times 19 over 6, well, that's the same as 19 over 3. So 19 over 3 is our final answer for our final last mark. This has been Claire Mastery. We've been looking at an integration question, quite a difficult one from 2015, paper two. Take care, stay safe, and goodbye. The chain rule. X squared higher maths 2016, paper two, question 10. Given it y it was x squared plus 7 over half, find the y by the x. And then part b, hence find the integral of this function, which we'll use our answer to part a to do. So part a, the y by the x is equal to, take the half down to the front, x squared plus 7, take 1 off the power, minus a half, and then we differentiate the bit inside the brackets, which is x squared, so that becomes 2x. So that equals 2x divided by 2 is just x, so x bracket x squared plus 7 to the minus a half. And then try to make it look a bit like our part b, that's x over x squared plus 7 to the half which is equal to x over the square root of x squared plus 7. Part b says integrate 4x over the square root of x squared plus 7, which is very similar. So if I do part b, integrate 4x over the square root of x squared plus 7 dx, well, if I just take that 4 out, I get the integral of x over the square root of x squared plus 7 dx, which I already know is exactly the same as what I found out up here, my differential. This integrated is exactly that. So I can just write the integral as x squared plus seven and a half. Simple as that. So that means I've got my answer is four times x squared plus seven to the power of a half. Or I must make that neater, x squared plus seven to the half. I've forgot my plus C, so there we are, plus C, and we're done there. For 18 people, one question. Now on vector pathways, it shows us a triangle of prism and it tells us some of the vectors. It says A to B is T, A to C is U, and A to B is V. Express B to C in terms of U and T. So I want to get from B to C, so I can go down this root minus t, and then along here, plus u. Job done. b to c equals minus t plus u. And we're done there. Let's do part b. m is the midpoint of b to c. Express m to d in terms of t 
u and v. So we're wanting to go from m, which is here, all the way over to d, and we need this free pathway we can take. So we could go down here, along there, and up here. So I suppose we need to work out what m to c is. So let's do that. m to c is equal to a half of b to c, which is equal to a half of minus t plus u. So now we know that, then m to d is simply looking at our root, a half of minus t plus u. And then, once we've done that, we go minus u plus v. Minus u plus v. Simplifying that, that's all minus a half t plus a half u minus u plus v. That's minus a half t, a half u minus u is minus a half u. And then we've got plus v done there. Just putting that old lines underneath. Because usually that's how you write vectors of both. SVA Hi, Maths for 18, paper 1, question 12 on vectors, addition in the modulus. Uh, vectors A and B are such that A is this and B is that. Express 2A plus B in component form. So component form is when you've got the brackets. So we've got 2A plus B. Well, that equals 2 times A. 2 fours are 8. 2 twos are 4. And 2 twos are 4 as well plus the b, which is minus 2, 1j, and pk. So then we can just add each element. 8 minus 2 is 6. Minus 4 plus 1 is minus 3. And we've got 4 plus p on the end. And we're done there. Part b. b says, hence find the values of p such that the modulus of 2a plus b is equal to 7. Okay. Modulus is the size of, right? So we've got the size of 2a plus b. Well, that equals, it's just Pythagoras, square each numbers and square root. So that's the square root of 6 squared plus minus 3 squared plus 4 plus p squared. And that equals 7. Now, that's a little bit unwieldy way to do. We'll sort of square both sides to get rid of the square root. So that gives us 6 squared plus minus 3 squared plus 4 plus p squared equals 49. Expand the brackets and simplify. 36 plus 9. 4 fours are 16. 4 times p is p times 2 is 8p. p times p is p squared. That equals 49. Moving everything to the same side and making it look like a quadratic then because it's got a p squared. We get p squared. And then we've got 36 plus 9 is 45, plus 16 is 55, 61. So plus 61 on the end. And then we've got plus 8p in the middle. And that equals 49. So moving the 49 over to make it a quadratic we can solve. 61 minus 49 is 12. That equals 0. So hopefully that's factorizable. From National 5 Maths, two numbers at times to make 12, but add to make 8. That must be 6 and 2, plus and plus. And therefore, P equals minus 2, or P equals minus 6, and we're done there. It's great, hi, Maths, 2016, paper 1, question 7 on vectors. Three vectors are expressed as follows, I'm not going to read them out, but it then says find F to H, and then find F to E. So we get a handle of what this question is asking us. If I draw a little picture, let's just call this F. I'm going up to G first. So there's G. And then it goes G to H. So let's just call that H. And then it goes H E to H. Well, I could go H to E then and just go the other way around for E to H. And then we could kind of complete the picture, I suppose, by saying that there's going to be a vector there. That's going to be my F to E. I have to find that one. So that's part B, say. And I have to find F to H, which is along the middle. So that's my part A. So we know, remember, all the solid lines. So for part A, F to H is equal to, let's just trace this out to make sure we don't make any mistakes. 
what I get from f to h, so I just go f to g plus g to h, f to g plus g to h. Now I find writing the vectors in this form easier, so f to g is minus 2 minus 6, 3, plus g to h is 3, 9 minus 7. Adding them together, minus 2 plus 3 is 1. Minus 6 plus 9 is 3. And then 3 take away 7 is minus 4. So we get 1, 3, minus 4. Uh, just writing that in the same format as the question. That's i plus 3j minus 4k. And we're done there. Part B, find f to e. So what we get from here to here, we can't go that way. So we can go any way we want, remember. So we can just go that to that and then that. But we might as well just go straight across now, because we know that, and then go down. So it's f to h plus h to e. f to h plus h to e. Well, we know f to h, we just did it. 1, 3, minus 4 plus h to e, well, it tells us e to h, so h to e is just the minus of that, so it's minus 2, minus 3, minus 1. Minus 2, minus 3, minus 1. 1 minus 2 is minus 1. 3 plus minus 3 is 0. And minus 4 plus minus 1 is minus 5. Or writing that out, minus i, minus 5j, k. I want done there. Hi, I'm 2019, paper 1, question 5 on vectors and collinearity. So it says show that the points A, B and C are collinear and then state the ratio at B divides A to C. So let's do part A first. To show that three points are collinear, especially 3D points, we can just compare A to B and the vector B to C. So let's do A to B first. The vector is A to B, remember, is B minus A. So vector B is 4 minus 1 and 0 minus a, which is 1, 5, minus 3. So we've got 4 minus 1 on the top is 3, minus 1 minus 5 is minus 6, and 0 minus minus 3 is 3. So we get 3 minus 6 and 3 for the first. The next one, b to c. That's c minus b. So that is 8 minus 9 and 4. Take away 4 minus 1 and 0. So 8 minus 4 is 4, uh, minus 9 minus minus 1, well that's plus 1, so that's minus 8, and then the last one, 4 minus 0 is 4. Now to show that they are collinear, we need to show that these two vectors are parallel. How do we do that? Well, all you have to do is show that you can times 1 to get the other. So we, if we just compare each element in turn, we do that divided by that, that divided by that, and that divided by that, and make sure we get the same answer. So 4 divided by 3 is the first one. And then we've got minus 8 over minus 6. Well, if I simplify that, divide that by 2, you get 4 over 3. So that's the second element. And then the third element, 4 over 3 again. So we can then say quite easily that b to c is equal to 4 thirds of a to c. a to b, sorry. And therefore... BC and AB are parallel. You could have also done the numbers the other way around and said three quarters and said that A to B is three quarters of B to C and it would make no difference. But we've shown the parallel and therefore but B is a common point. As you can see, because you've got BC and AB. So you just say B is a common point and therefore a, B, and C are collinear. And we're done there. It's great, Higher Maths. 2018 paper one question five, vectors and collinearity. A, A, B, and C are collinear. State the ratio B to size A to C. So if B divides A to C, we can find A to B and B to C and then compare them. So let's do A to B first. Remember that's B minus A. So that is 5t5 minus, minus 3, 4, minus 7. So now taking away them, 5 minus minus 3 is 8. t minus 4. 
and 5 minus minus 7 is 12. So we get our A to B, now let's do the same for B to C. So that's C minus B. So that equals 798. Minus 5T5. 7 minus 5 is 2. 9 minus T. Don't worry about them now, that'll be for part B. And 8 minus 5 is 3. And now we're still going to compare the elements. So you have the first element, 8 to 2, well that's 4. Dividing by 4, 12 to 3 is 4. So the ratio that B divides A to C, B divides A to C, and the ratio 4 to 1. Part B state the value of T. Well, we know that 4 times BC equals AB. So for part B, 4 times BC equals AB. So that means that we can say that 4 lots of 9 minus T is equal to T minus 4. 4 nines is 36 minus 4T is T minus 4. 36 plus 4, that gives you 40 on this side, equals 4t plus t is 5t, so t must equal 8. And what that means. Next Maths 2019, Paper 2, Question 3, on vectors of vector pathways. It says E, A, B, C, D is a rectangular-based pyramid. It tells you that A to B is P, as shown. A to D is Q, as shown there. And e, A to E is R. And we have to express B to E in terms of P and R. So where's B to E? I need to start here and get up to there. So then we can take any direction you want. So I can just trace this. I go minus P. So I can write minus P. I've done minus P and I want to get all the way up to E. So I can go up R. So plus R. And that's it. It really is as simple as that. Point F divides BC in the ratio 3 to 1. Express the vector EF in terms of PQ and R. So EF, just to be clear, is from here down to there. I want to get to there, but I need to go a path that I can actually use. So we could go along there, down there, and then back to there, and that will give me that. So let's just trace that out. I've got minus R plus P. So it's like that down to start with, minus R plus P. And then... Once I've done minus R plus P, I need to go along here. I know how far along am I going? Well, it says it divides it in the ratio 3 to 1. So if I imagine that this whole length is 4, I've went along 3 out of 4 bits. 3 quarters, and what is B to C's vector? Well, it's the same as this one, because it's parallel. So it's 3 quarters of Q. So plus 3 quarters of Q. And we're done there. 19, paper 1, question 9 on vectors and scalar product. Vectors u and v have these components, where p is a member of the real numbers. Find an expression for u dot v for part 1. Well, u dot v is told to you at the start of the exam paper. If you forget, it's either got an angle in it, or it is times each element, then plus the second element, then plus the third element, all times together. So I can just write that down. I've got p times 2p plus 16, plus minus 2 times minus 3, plus 4 times 6. So then we can just simplify that. Expand my bracket, I get 2p squared plus 16p plus 2 3s are 6, minus times a minus is a plus, 6 4s is 24. So that's 2p squared plus 16p plus 30 is our simplified u dot v. Part 2. Determine the values for p for which u and v are perpendicular. Well, you do, if u and v are perpendicular, that means that u dot v equals zero. And that, why is that? Well, if you look at the start of the exam paper, you're given the formula sheet, which says that u dot v is also the size of a times the size of b times the cosine of theta. Now, if theta was 90, cos of 90 is equal to zero, so u dot v is zero when they're perpendicular. But you could just memorize that. So u dot v equals zero means I can write 2p squared plus 16p plus 30 equals zero. Take 2 out as a common factor, p squared plus 8p plus 15. So that's a quadratic. So from National 5 Maths, I'm looking for double brackets probably. 
Two numbers that times together to make 15, but add together to make 8, well that's 5 and 3. So it's plus 5 and plus 3. So that means that p plus 3 equals 0, or p plus 5 equals 0. Solving both of the equations, we get p equals minus 3, or p equals minus 5. And we're done there. Our b says, determine the value of p for which u and b are parallel. So if they're parallel, that means that I can times this one by something to get this one. So let's just compare the elements. I've got minus 3 over minus 2, that's 3 halves. And similarly, I've got 6 over 4, which is also 3 halves. That means that if I times this one by 3 halves, I get this one. So I can just write that down. 3 halves of p equals 2p plus 16. So for part b, 3 halves of p equals 2p plus 16. So we've got that equation to solve. So if I put brackets around that side, uh, that means I can times by the bottom. So 3p is equal to 2 times 2p plus 16. 3p equals 4p plus 32. So taking that over to the other side, you would get minus p equals 32, or p equals minus 32. And we're done there. Yes, we have maths for 18 paper 2 question 8 on the vector scale of product. U and B are defined as B's vectors, find u dot b. Start of the exam paper tells you what u dot b is. You times each element and you add. So u dot b is equal to minus 1 times minus 7 plus 4 times 8 plus minus 3 times 5. That gives us 7 plus 32 minus 15. 7 plus 32 is 39. 39 minus 15 is 24. Okay, part B. Find the acute angle between U and V. So again, the start exam paper. A dot B is equal to the size of A plus the size of B times the cos of theta. So we know the size of... We know that A dot B, so we need to find the size of U and V. So the size of U is equal to the square root of minus 1 squared plus 4 squared plus minus 3 squared. Minus 1 squared plus 4 squared plus minus 3 squared. That's the square root of 1 plus 16 plus 9. That is 26. And then the size of V is equal to the square root of minus 7 squared plus 8 squared plus 5 squared. Forty nine plus sixty four plus twenty five. Use the calculator anytime you want. That's one three eight. So that means that u dot v is equal to we know that's twenty four. So twenty four equals square root of twenty six, square root of one three eight, cos theta. So rearranging for cos theta. That means that cos theta is 24 over the square root of 26 times the square root of 138. So our theta is the inverse cos of all that. So we just get a calculator and work it out. So the inverse cos, 24 over root. 26 times root 138. That gives me an answer of 66.38. So theta equals 66.84 degrees. And we're done there. We have Maths 16, paper 2, question 5 on vectors. The diagram picture shows a model of a water molecule. Relative to a suitable coordinate axis, the oxygen atom is positioned at A minus 225. So there's minus 225. The other two hydrogen atoms are point B and C as shown. Express A to B and A to C in component form. Okay, so for part A, A to B is equal to B minus A. So B is a position vector, minus 10, 18, and 7. Take away minus 2, 2, and 5. 
minus 10 minus minus 2 is minus 8, because we're adding. 18 minus 2 is 16, and 7 minus 5 is 2. So that is our answer to part A, and that is component form, by the way, so stop there. And then A to C is C minus A. So we know C is minus 4, minus 6, 21. Minus A, which was minus 2, 2, 5. So minus 4 plus 2 is minus 2. Minus 6 minus 2 is minus 8. 21 minus 5 is 16. Now we're done there for part A. Part B, hence the last thing, angle BAC. So it's in there. So we know that from the start of the exam paper, we can find A dot B. The start of the exam paper tells you two things. It tells you A dot B is the size of A times the size of B times the cos of the angle in between. But it also tells you that A dot B is just the vectors times together, times the components and add. So we know this vector, A to C and A to B. So we can just do A to B dot A to C and find out what that is. A to B dot A to C is equal to minus 8 times minus 2, the first numbers, plus 16 times minus 8, the second numbers, plus 2 times 16, the first numbers. Calculator for all these sums, that gives me 16 minus 128 plus 32. And a calculator that gives me minus 80. So I know what a dot there minus 80. So now I need the size of AB. Because that would be the size of A basically. So AB, remember, is minus 8, 16, 2. So it's a square root of minus 8 squared plus 16 squared plus 2 squared. And a calculator that gives you 3, 2, 4, which is the square root of 3, 2, 4 is 18. Similarly, the size of A to C is equal to, well, A to C is minus 2 minus 8, 16. Square root of minus 2 squared plus minus 8 squared plus 16 squared is the square root of 3, 2, 4 as well. Same size, which it should be because it's a molecule, but never mind that. That's 18. So we now know that looking at our A dot B is the size of A, size of B cos theta. We already know that dot product is minus 80, so we can see that minus 80 equals 18 times 18 times the cos of theta, or in other words, cos theta is minus 80 over 18 times 18. So theta is the inverse cos of minus 80 over 18 times 18. That equals 104.3 degrees. And there is only one answer because it is an acute angle. So we're done there. Obviously, just a note, you could have used the cast diagram and did 80 over 18 times 18 and then picked the correct angle using the test diagram. But in this case, you can get away with putting a minus in the calculator on this one occasion. Next, we have math 19, paper 2, question 14, magnitude and scale product of a vector. We've got two vectors, u and v, such that the size of u is 4, the size of v is 5, and u dot u plus v is 21. Find the size of the angle in between. So let's start off with, if we look at the start of the exam paper, a dot b is size a, size b, times the cost of the angle in between them. So we're going to kind of use that fact. So we've got u dot u plus v. Well, we can expand that just by saying we've got u dot u plus u dot v. So u dot u is equal to the size of u times the size of u times the cos of theta. But what's the angle in between a vector and itself? Is, well, it's nothing. So it's the cos of nothing. Plus the size of u times the size of v times the cos of theta, because we don't know that angle, but that equals 21. Well, the cos of 0 is 1. So we've got the size of u times the size of u. 4 times 4 times the cos of 0 is 1 plus 4 times 5 times the cos of theta equals 21. So that gives me 16 plus 20 cos theta equals 21. 
21 minus 16 is 5, so 20 cos theta is equal to 5, which means that cos theta is equal to 5 over 20, or a quarter. So then, put into our calculator, the inverse cos of a quarter, that's 75.5 degrees, and it is just the angle in between the two vectors is acute, so we don't need to do a cast diagram or anything like that. 75.5 degrees is our answer. So theta equals 75.5 degrees, and we're done there.